Welcome to this, the Tuesday, February 11th, 2020, Shelburne Select Board meeting, which I now call to order. The next item is to approve the agenda. Is there a motion to that effect? Mike moves. Second. Colleen seconds. Any discussion? Any comment from the audience? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Nay, the ayes have it, Jamie having just arrived. The next item is to approve the meeting minutes of January 21, 2020, our previous meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? These were just provided. Mm -hmm. If any of us feel we should pen this until the 25th so we can read them, that would seem appropriate. I'm fine. I just read it. Yeah, I, I read think them. they're fine. I think we circulated them. We won't have enough. a quorum on the 25th to approve or deny them since I wasn't here at that Absolutely. Anyway. Good point. Meanwhile, it sounds as if we're ready to move. I'll move to approve. Mike moves approval. Second. Colleen seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Thank you. The next item are public comments. Hey, how you doing? Of course, I uh, managed not to get on the agenda tonight, so I am going to give you an update from here. Uh, just quickly, for this is all for the tree committee. Uh, annually, we have to reapply for Tree City USA uh, status. No fee involved. It is due this Friday, so of course, I'm right on time. <laughs> Uh, there's four criteria that we have to meet in order to apply for Tree City USA status, which we have met every year. The first one is having a tree board or committee, which we have. The second is having a tree policy, tree uh, ordinance of some sort, which we have. The third is Arbor Day. Arbor Day proclamation this year. We actually had it signed on and before Arbor Day, yay. And the fourth piece is being able to show that the community spends $2 per capita per person uh, in the town. And we estimated, with Dean's help, 7,775 people in Shelburne. Based on that, with the amount of uh, dollars that are set aside within the budget, plus we have over 411 volunteer hours for our committee and volunteers working on tree-related stuff, we uh, exceed that uh, $2 per capita. We're, we're over $3 this year. So I want to give you a heads up, and hopefully that's OK that we go ahead and apply, and, and Lee can magically sign the application before Friday for us. Tell them we just dare them to come take our signs away. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I think this year we get the number three. <laughs> just a couple of quick things I want to also just give you a heads up on um, the urban and community forestry grant application that we submitted last month. We just found out today, and I'm, hopefully I'm not stealing the steam out of your report, but yeah. uh, we did not get awarded money this year. Uh, they had $51,000 worth of requests and $25,000 to hand out, and as sad as we are, we have been pretty lucky and have received a grant every single year that we've applied. So hopefully we can find out what we need to do for next year to make it even better. But for this year, we, we did not successfully get a grant. It's okay to share. That's true. So it's not, it's not terrible. There's other communities doing wonderful things with helping to take care of trees in their communities. Uh, as part of the current grant that we have uh, that we received last year for uh, Emerald Ash Borer uh, work. Uh, part of that work involved getting our two uh, iPads that we're using for, collect, uh, for data collection for doing our tree inventory. And then the other piece that we hadn't done as of yet is the Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan. We have now successfully found three UVM students who are interns for this semester. They're meeting with us tomorrow night. They have a, a proposal all put together. They've got a contract that we have to sign with them. So over the next three months, they will be working with us to pull this uh, plan together. And the goal is that it will be done the end of April. 
or the beginning of May, what, I don't know exactly what date <clears throat> yet, but they will have to come and give a presentation to the select board of the plan. So I wanted to just give you a heads up that we'll have to run it by us first, but <laughs> we will be doing that. And then the committee has been working on a few things uh, that we will be bringing to you. We'll, we'll get a, a memo to Lee with, with the documents. One is some revisions to the existing tree policy. There's been an issue of dealing with, there's one clause in there about dealing with trees on private property that we really don't want to deal with anymore that really we shouldn't be dealing with. So we're going to provide some edits for that and bring that to you. The second piece is that we have worked over the last couple of years in putting together uh, tree protection during construction specifications. And we just feel that this is really important for any project that the town has, but in addition, hopefully, the Development Re Review Board and the Public Works Buildings and Grounds Departments will use it in, in their work. Uh, just when construction is going on, everybody thinks that the roots are all right underneath the tree and they actually go way out. And there's just, we can do a lot to protect trees during construction and still be able to get construction done. So we'll, we've been working with the Urban and Community Forestry Program on it. They had a, a draft specification that we started with. We've edited it to be specific to Shelburne. So both of those documents, I just wanted to give you a heads up. We'll be bringing them to you shortly, so thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, seeing no hands. The next item are select board comments. Do you want to lead off, Mike? I have none tonight. Thank you. Mary? I have two. Uh, one, I want to remind everybody to vote on uh, March 3rd this year. Um, I actually, I attended the uh, Board of Civil Authority meeting last night, and the town is prepared this year. It's a presidential primary. So what that means is you'll get you'll have to declare whether you want a Republican or a Democratic ballot, but only for the presidential vote, not for anything having to do with town vote. There were a lot of questions about that last night, so I thought I would clarify that. A lot of work is going into getting organized for that um, uh, for that voting on March 3rd, and I encourage everybody to vote. The other thing I wanted to mention is tomorrow night, the uh, Shelburne Historical Society is hosting a talk by Howard Coffin, who is a local historian, uh, about the, the role of women in Vermont in the Civil War. Um, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a Civil War buff, but I um, read a lot about the Civil War, and it makes me proud to be a Vermonter um, for that reason, because you might be surprised to hear Vermont has sent 35,000 Vermonters fought in the Civil War. And as Howard Coffin has said, uh, the saying was, don't shoot until the Vermonters shoot, because they were such good marksmen that everybody relied on them to know when it was the right time to do that. But anyway, it should be a really good talk. It's at the Old Town Hall. I encourage people to come. It's at 7 o'clock. Thanks, Mary. Colleen? Nope, nothing. Jamie? No comments tonight. I've got uh, several, uh, the first of which is to, to thank, as usually we do, uh, our public works and emergency services for the help over the weekend. Uh, any of us who had to be anywhere Friday, much less Saturday, can appreciate the fact, not only the usual difference between our town line and the other, uh, the other side of it, but the fact that it was uh, uh, prompt and thorough and professional and left nothing to be desired in the way of uh, unplowed anything or unsalted. Uh, it doesn't just happen automatically. It doesn't happen without a lot of effort and, uh, and commitment on the part of a lot of staff members. And uh, once again, uh, uh, we, we express our appreciation. Now, uh, several, several people have uh, spoken to me recently about the absence of a vote on the acquisition of the Rice property for the fire rescue facility uh, in, the, in the warrant. And I thought it might be useful to just uh, uh, very briefly note that that vote is presently scheduled to, to occur no later than Election Day in November of this year. 
the vote is dependent upon uh, the site being deemed suitable, that, that analytic work having been completed, and then a decision that it is a suitable site, and none of that has occurred. So for the reason of that, there is no, uh, no article on uh, voting for acquisition of the site or investing in the, in the so-called uh, hard, soft infrastructure. Uh, we, have our, we do have in the budget, however, an amount which we anticipate will be sufficient to cover the costs of borrowing should the town in November or sooner approve the acquisition. So you will see an item which refers to fire rescue facility, but you will not see, as some of you had expected, an article that uh, that uh, asks for your, uh, uh, um, sees w how you feel about acquiring the site and making investments in uh, the infrastructure. Uh, I thank you. Any further comments? Hearing none, the next item are is to welcome new businesses. Uh, once again, I'm going to be brief. Uh, we are inaugurating this item tonight as a regular feature of our meetings. It will recognize new and newly expanded local businesses uh, since, uh, 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 but it should not be, I, I'm trusting that it will be accepted by the community as not an endorsement or a promotion or some type of, of, of market advantage for the businesses so identified. It's simply our way of uh, taking uh, an additional step to strengthen Shelburne's uh, reputation as being open for business. And in this case, we are fortunate tonight to have a, a person representing one of the new ones and we'll continue this uh, uh, a meeting upon meeting. We're, we're, uh, we're very enthusiastic and optimistic that there will be more businesses than meetings this year so that we will not run out of, of, out of folks to introduce. Lee, do you want to make the introduction? Sure. So we have several businesses lined up over the next few meetings. This evening we have representatives from one day in July. And I'd like to welcome them, give you a chance to introduce yourselves and well, thank say you. who you are. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I know you got a full agenda, so I'll make it brief. But um, as Lee mentioned, we're called One Day in July. It's an investment advisory firm. Uh, we just moved in about a month and a half ago mm -hmm. next to the Bearded Frog Restaurant. So you probably see the sign when you're driving by there. Um, our business is um, an offshoot of a business that started about three years ago in Burlington. Um, by a guy named Dan Cunningham, and the idea with our business is low-fee, simple, understandable investment solutions for individuals and for businesses. So, um, you know, the model's been really well received in Burlington. We felt like it was a great time to start a new uh, location here in Shelburne. Um, I'm a Shelburne resident myself, so we were fairly stubborn about wanting to be here. Um, just we, we think the location's a really good one. Um, we, we like the traffic pattern, and we're really excited to be here. So far, the reception's been great, um, so hopefully that'll continue. And that's all I've got for you, unless there are questions. We you know, appreciate the opportunity. Your name? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Josh Kruk. Thank you. K-R-U-K. <laughs> um, and my wife, Sarah, and I live uh, over by the uh, Bearded, uh, by the Bearded Frog, by uh, uh, Beaver it. Creek in that area. Thank you. Well, we welcome you. Thank you. Absolutely. How did you come up with the name One Day in July? So it was actually Dan that came up with it, and I was mentioning this to Jerry earlier. So the idea there was that he was looking, at one day in July, he was looking at his parents' statement from one of the bigger financial services shops, and he saw the returns, and he saw the fees, and he saw that he could do a lot better than that. So he started a new one, um, you know, and, and again, the idea is lower fees, simpler, um, and then so that's where the name came from. That's Thank great. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Lee? Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the town report has gone to the printer. Uh, thanks to Peter Frankenberg for his essential behind the scenes work on the financial piece of it. And I'd like to thank Nini Anger and Sue Craig, who did incredible work behind the scenes also organizing it, putting it together. I think you'll really like how it looks, how it reads, and uh, it's gone to press. Excellent. 
Also, um, I'm very pleased to announce that the Pearson Library Town Center project received the Honor Award for Commercial Building Design and Construction at last week's Best of the Best 20 Award Ceremony for Efficiency Vermont. Mm -hmm. And in addition, there were about half a dozen awards that were given, but then there were hundreds of participants at this conference. And they also had a People's Choice vote by all the participants, and our project also won the People's Choice Award. Oh, wow. Congratulations. So, a lot of recognition for the value of that project, its energy, efficiency, and the design and aesthetic of it all. So, really nice. <clears throat> and also, continuing good news, um, I've been reading online about Shelburne native Megan Nick, who, as part of her grad challenge several years ago at CVU, went over to Lake Placid to do an aerial freestyle ski camp. She was invited to join the U.S. team, and she had her first podium finish in Deer Valley this past weekend. Oh, so, great. young person took their grad challenge, and there she's going places with this oh, yeah, on the exactly. world on the world circuit. She's competing all over the world now. Wow, that's excellent. I've never done any aerials before. Just going on a grad challenge. Went on a, I mean, she must have been a good skier to yeah, start with. Yeah. But a couple articles online about her. It's fun to see and. Um, it's fun to see one of our own. Maybe she could take us all and do some aerials. <laughs> yeah, I see you up there. You upside down. Tell us how it went. Yeah, I thought that was really fun. That's fun to see. And um, finally, as you might might be aware. In the world of first responders, there's been a lot of awareness and effort lately on, on first responder wellness, people who police, fire, rescue, dispatchers who deal with difficult circumstances. And um, I went to a conference the state held a month or two ago. It was sold out in a flash. And I'm going to a workshop tomorrow night in Williston as well. And the goal is to try to start building a peer network, a peer support network for first responders. So something I'm trying to be attuned to and aware of and be helpful. You, wow. you reportedly a great success with, uh, uh, with Vermont OSHA. You want to briefly sure. reprise that? Sure, if you'd like. So last year, we received a surprise visit from VOSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health folks. And they come looking, and you have to let them come inspect all of your facilities, look at your documentation, look at your systems. And it's a challenging process. It's a surprise visit. Um, it can be difficult to deal with. Um, at the end of the day, we, the town was assessed nearly $65,000 in fines. And many of those were for supposed or actual failure to document practices. It's not that we actually had unsafe practices or we're putting our workers at risk because we all want everyone to be safe. Um, we began immediately to address those issues that were raised. Nini reformed the town safety committee. The town departments have been very helpful and enthusiastic in addressing these things. We had a formal meeting with VOSHA after all of that and negotiated the fines down to $29,000 and then got them to agree that any money we had to spend to abate problems could be deducted from the fines. So. Bottom line is we spent roughly $10,000 so far on abating issues, documenting issues, and so we had to send VOSHA a check for roughly $19,000, far cry from the 65 where we started. And I'm pleased to say town departments continue to be interested in addressing these. We will institute some annual updates and documentation of the things that we're already doing. Many of the issues they raise can be frustrating to people, and it would be easy to complain or criticize rather than just get the work done. And we are doing that. Lee, did you have help from the town attorney to negotiate that, or did you guys do it on your own? We did it on our own, but we had significant help from Jim Carrion at the League of Cities and Towns, Passif, our insurance agent. We immediately contacted the League, of course, when this first came to light, and he's been really, really, really helpful with strategy and approach and circumstance. It's great. So we didn't do it ourselves, but we, we got the job done. 
Wonderful. That's, that's, that's super. And I wanted to give a, I wanted to be sure we gave a shout out to Jim because, uh, yeah. uh, as uh, Peter knows as well, that kind of support service is fairly unique to uh, Passive, our property and casualty and workers' comp provider. And uh, in this case, it was, it was, you might call it profitable, actually. It was pretty instrumental. Yes. And uh, so we, we express great appreciation uh, for it and uh, thank Jim in absentia. Absolutely. Any, any thank questions? You. Uh, Can I, Liam, have we been audited like that before? Do you know? Do we have any record? There of was a visit. Apparently, once you conclude this kind of process, you're off the charts for the next five years, but they can show up at any time. They didn't come because anyone filed a complaint. They said it was random luck of the draw. Hmm. Okay. But we could certainly expect a revisit. Right. Yes. And probably sooner than later. Well, they tell us we're good for five years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be hopeful. And we're ready. And we yeah. will be. OK. Thank you. We will yeah, okay. put them. Next item, any discussion, questions? The next item is select board participation on committees, and this is to clarify the select board member role. Uh, uh, in uh, late last year, as the liaison, one of the liaisons from the select board to the Natural Resources Conservation Committee Wildlife Subcommittee, I voted at a meeting to approve the agenda and I, as well to approve the minutes. I was mistaken to do that. Since the select board liaison role is an observer role, it is not a voting membership, and in that case, I confused the two. Uh, the charter provides uh, for, a, uh, for a prohibition against the appointment of select board members to commissions. That may be up to interpretation on someone else's account, but it seems to me, in retrospect, that commissions is a generic term for committees, boards, subcommittees, pro tem committees, and anything of the like. So my, my, uh, at, at a succeeding meeting, uh, which Mike and I attended, we did not vote. And I wouldn't, of course, anticipate doing so again. Uh, in any case, I'm suggesting that we take the opportunity by this lesson at our organizational meeting on March 10th, where, where there will be a new select board uh, to uh, uh, better define what a liaison role is, clarify that it is advisory and, uh, and, and, and not by any means a, a voting membership, and perhaps codify that in the select board rules. Any questions? Well, actually, just to clarify that it's specifically within the liaison role versus... Correct. Like our, because you mentioned pro temp committee, and we would consider the um, the Pearson Library uh, Building Committee as a pro temp committee, and I would say that that the liaison role doesn't qualify for that. Like that was specifically yeah. formulated for a project, and it was every member on that in that committee was a voting member, including myself and oh, and so did yeah. I uh, for a and year. You. So yeah. I, I, I think this intent. is the exception that proves the rule because the. The uh, project committee had such responsibilities in, uh, in managing resources, among other things, that uh, I personally never hesitated in, in my role on it uh, to vote and to take active part. So I think you make a good point, and perhaps we should recognize that, that potential in, uh, in our rules. Right, and there is, and that, and that committee preceded your um, uh, position as a select board member. But I was there prior to the. Correct, you and, were in the yeah. same role. Yeah. And yeah. I was there for the formation of the committee. Yeah. Um, for a project to see, yeah. to see if it could get off the ground. So there, ha it had every member had to be um, a voting member. No, I agree, Colleen. So but a, a strict yeah, reading of. We, yeah, a strict reading of the I charter it says it shouldn't think, have been. Yeah. Yeah. So it may yeah. merit a charter change. Frankly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there may need to be some clarification yeah, around. Clarify and understand. I mean, I'm on the fire and rescue committee, and I voted. 
And somebody right, brought I, it to my attention, too. You know, the charter yeah. says you're not supposed to be on committees. I think we may need to be very intentional in the motions when we form those subcommittees yeah. to delegate voting authority you have to and clarify that to be very specific yeah. right. about what authority is being granted yeah, yeah. and yeah. why but i yeah I, i'm thankful that you brought this back up because i think the community will clarity. respect the fact that this occurred in bursts of enthusiasm <laughs> and, yeah. and, and involved <laughs> meetings and agenda approvals uh that but i don't minimize it in any important way because there's obviously a very strong principle about a board select board member being a a, a being a voting member of such as a uh, as a planning commission or a DRB, right. I mean, or ethics committee is as I clear think that's as a bell. The spirit of yeah. the charter. Yeah, and preparing, yes. yeah, you know, preparing material that you're then going to yeah. vote on and vote exactly. on. So, yeah. 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 I think yeah. I think uh, our best bet probably at this point is to is to as we have not as to discontinue anything. Along those lines, and uh, on the tenth, when the board meets to to review its rules, take up that matter with probably some ideas uh, coming from. Uh, so the, uh, the Lee. library was the, that was a project committee. You weren't on the library of trustees, right? So that's the was, distinction, right? It was, but I guess you would it consider it a short term advisory, advisory, committee. advisory committee versus mm -hmm. Jerry like sitting yeah. on the natural committee. resources committee at a regular meeting. And voting but at the same time like we voted um, you know the two members of this uh, the Board of Trustees the librarian town manager who was basically the other select board member if you will and myself and then Jerry and we voted together to on what we wanted to have happen and we voted to present that to the select board and right. then I sat yeah. on the select board and voted on what I what I recommended as part of that other committee. So it isn't. So when you said that, I'm like, well, we did vote I think on those special things. Special committees are different than a DRB. Standing, standing yeah. committees. I, and I think, yeah, I think, yeah. I think yeah. this is the issue things. we need to clarify right. yeah. on the tenth. Just know. be careful yeah. when you guys go forward. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have to at least be cognizant of it yeah. and understand the implications. Yeah, so. we have some cleanup to do on that, but okay. more of a disclosure than anything. Yeah. yeah. Any Sorry. discussion? Question. Hearing none, the next item is the short-term rental issues, an introduction of which I think uh, Lee or Jamie's. I, I'm happy to, you know, tee this one up. I requested that this be added to the agenda over the course of the last couple of years. We've had a number of residents come in and just sort of present this issue to us as a topic that short-term rentals may require regulation in the town, and this is not something that would be groundbreaking as far as Vermont municipalities go. Stowe has in ordinance a few other municipalities do as well. So it struck me as maybe a time for us to just revisit this since I've had a couple calls come in around um, just a need as far as quality of life goes for some type of regulation around this, whether it takes the form of an ordinance or a bylaw amendment. So I just wanted to present it to the board and ask for any input if there's general consensus that there might be interest in moving this forward, then that's great. If not, then happy to leave it at that. Is this, um, when you, what, what defines short-term rental? Really, this is in the context of the Airbnb yeah, so I was curious about regulation. That. Yeah. And that would be something the Planning Commission would undertake? I think initially we would instruct the Planning Commission to develop a proposal, conduct public hearings around whether they decide an ordinance or a bylaw mm -hmm. change is the appropriate path. And then for Burlington, us to evaluate it, right, Burlington has. Right yeah. Now, and I believe they've already, maybe they didn't pass an ordinance, but I think it's proposed uh, that um, all Airbnbs or short-term rentals be owner-occupied. So at a minimum, you can't go and, you know, buy something and use it as an Airbnb and never live right. there. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily sufficient. Um, I think there are other concerns as well, but they're a little bit more private. One is some Airbnbs are really unsafe. Um, I, you know, and you want to make sure that when residents are, or when people are coming to your town to stay, that they're in a safe environment. So that's another concern that I think towns are addressing. I'm all for it, uh, considering an ordinance of some sort that would deal with these concerns. 
Dean, at one point, with, with your permission, Lee, at one point, I think you reviewed the two, the two potential paths that we could take, didn't you? Would you? Yeah, I forget the exact date, but there was a presentation that did spell out some options. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been something that the Planning Commission has on its own taken up. They do have authority under statute to work on ordinances, and it would be appropriate. Um, time may be the issue. Right. So Please. just to... Oh, sorry, Colin. No, go ahead. Uh, no, no, go ahead. I don't see what, Lee, what comment Lee might make. Well, if it's the select board's wish, we can certainly begin some work on it. The question, as with any sort of rule, is what is it we really think we're going to be regulating and how enforced. equitably can it be enforced? And, you know, the issues that have been brought here while I've been here have been related to behavior, not so much the use itself. And I don't condone uncivil behavior, but you could have that in an owner-occupied home just as in the same challenging way as in a short-term rental. I know in some communities there's been wholesale conversion to short-term rentals, and it does really change the fabric of a single-family residential neighborhood. But it gets to the heart of, are we just looking to license it if we're going to be concerned about safety? Do we have the resources to inspect these right. uses? So not arguing against it, but we just always want to be clear, what is it we actually think we're regulating yeah, no, or are we fair. creating I mean, a li licensing thing? Licensing and registration <laughs> would be one path to consider, and I defer to the Planning Commission on yeah. a proposal to us, right? They're sort of vested with authority to explore it and mm -hmm. probably best situated to evaluate mm -hmm. it. And I think I'm all ears as far as what approach they want to take. I think there are probably merits to looking at an ordinance, and I know there's some legal uh, issues that will need to be evaluated as well, so. I think, like, considering that we don't even have the manpower to enforce our zoning bylaws, it makes it well, hard yeah. to spend the time to come up with legislation and um, and other things that we're not going to be able to enforce. Like, I believe in setting down rules that are enforceable. Sure. I think having an ordinance itself will have some deterrent impact and something that can be pointed to and hopefully... A mechanism that we might be able to, you know, use to at least curb some of the behavior that's happening out there. I think it's only going to expand. The trend is going up. I think we'll see more and more of it in town, and inevitably it's it's this group, whoever is sitting up here and town staff, who are going to be getting a lot of phone calls about how quality of life is being compromised by Airbnbs in their backyard. So, Do we have a – I'm trying to – look for mechanisms to get feedback from the community. I'm wondering if there are like neighborhood associations that we have a list of or who could, you know, could we ask for sort of boots on the ground? Well, we could have the commission could have a, a few hearings and then presumably those people would come and do that and yeah. speak. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. I think that would be the hearing good, on front yeah. porch forum and you know, right. in those situations, you know, you end up it's it's not clear whether you get a a, a fair, good, yeah, cross, complete yeah, yeah. representation of uh, the situation. So maybe doing some canvassing makes sense. Yeah. My, my sense of it, uh, Lee, is that I think we should proceed to the point of more than just signaling a concern to the point where we're looking at actual pro and con uh, mechanisms for, for accomplishing some controls here. I mean, uh, my sense is that that the, the Airbnb is an invitation to that behavior, not just uh, not just a, a you know a, a coexistence with it. And uh, um, but I think we should we should uh, last time we discussed it, we went over the the, uh, the the potential difficulties, including enforcement. And as Colleen comments, you never want to do uh, a regulation that can't be that you can't enforce. But uh, I think if the Planning Commission were willing, it would be important for us to take several more steps and arrive at a point where we could talk about uh, substantive you know, differences and choose a path and then concern ourselves with uh, how, we, you know, how we were going to yeah. reinforce it. You know, one, one thing that does occur to me that enforcement would, uh, for this kind of thing, would be a little bit easier than 
you know, um, somebody putting an ad on their house or something right. like that. And the reason I think that is because the problem that's being created is one where neighbors are feeling impacted. And I would think that if an ordinance is passed, say that says owner occupied, it must be owner occupied, um, and then it appears to a neighbor that it, you know they know their neighbor hasn't been there in six months because they're on sabbatical and there's people transients coming, you're going to get that complaint. I favor that. You know, we should all remember that Airbnb was created the people who own Airbnb, the creator created it because he couldn't pay his rent. And he went and got an air mattress, and that's how it got to be Airbnb. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose is this couch surfing idea, not a mini hotel uh, in the middle of a residential yeah. neighborhood. And so, yeah, all the weekend. Yeah. You know, but isn't it amazing how that it's how it's evolved? So now, as a family, you can rent a home someplace in a safe neighborhood, like my husband and I and our children. Or uh, a woman whose husband has passed away and she lives in her house by herself and, um, and she can rent to people and she can screen them mm -hmm. and help pay her mortgage and her taxes so she can stay in the town of Shelburne. Like, it's amazing how that's evolved okay. from yeah. some guy yeah. who no, couldn't pay his rent. I think it, Airbnb is a good thing. I use them all the time myself. Uh, just used one that was totally unsafe, got to say. One exit and all the windows were barred in Venice, California, so... Yeah. It was, yeah, so. I think we should find a balance to somehow allow homeowners to make a little bit of income, if that's yeah. a consideration, but also limit it to two weeks a year or some reasonable amount of time so it's not a summer party house, right? I think that's sort of, But again, it goes back to mind. the behavior, not really the, the, mm -hmm. the actual rental of the place. It's the behavior of the people renting. So it's the behavior you're trying to regulate. I think it's, I think it's both. I think some people would say it's not only the behavior, but also the fact that it's just um, short term, that it's transitional people coming in and out of a neighborhood. And some folks don't like that. Some people don't. I, I mean, I'm worried that we have a, a solution in search of a problem. I mean, I'd like to know that we have a problem. So let's, you know, I'd like to see some. Yeah, some I agree. Stumping. I think there should be hearings and yeah, they yeah. should take input yeah, from the public. See, let's see what people are thinking. Okay. Hey, Lee. Yes. Thank you. Any, any comment? Any discussion? Uh, the next item are public hearings on proposed amendments to zoning and subdivision bylaws, and by the recommendation of staff, we will uh, entertain motions to, for, to separate the hearings into two. Uh, in the first case, I think it's the uh, uh, bylaw amendments, or is it the subdivision bylaw amendments, or is it the form-based, whichever you prefer. Welcome. If you're going to uh, split them, my recommendation would actually be to separate the form-based zoning and subdivision from the historic preservation and design uh -huh. review because the subdivision amendment is really dependent on the form-based zoning. Okay. Um, could involve more extensive discussion. The historic preservation or design review overlay issue, um, it's in the same bylaw, the zoning bylaw, but I think it would possibly be separated. Okay. Well, I hear a motion to open the hearing on proposed amendments to the subdivision bylaws. So moved. Uh, Mary moves. And so, and the form-based zoning. Yes, it, these are, if, if you want to break it into two separate hearings, one for the subdivision and one for the zoning regs, yes, a, a subsequent motion on the zoning bylaws to follow the one on the subdivision. I thought you were talking about breaking the hearings up into kind of conceptual groups. The subdivision doesn't stand alone. The subdivision regulations are that part of the form based really zoning. Connected to form -based yeah. zoning. So the motion should include both subdivision and form based zoning. Uh, that would be and my then we recommendation. Do the historical one, secondly. <coughs> that would be my recommendation to split no. them. I view it as a friendly amendment. <laughs> that was Mary's amendment as I heard it. Is there a second? Second. Jamie seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The hearing is open. Um, if I have the floor, I would be happy to run through some slides very, very quickly. I understand you've got half an hour for this. I was 
looking around for the chair of the Planning Commission. He doesn't seem to be here, so I will fly along without him. If I could interrupt just one quick minute. We have some extra copies of this. If those of you in the rear would like to pass this around so you have a sense of what we're looking at and talking about, I'm happy to provide it for you. Someone would be willing to come up and could grab it, and then you could, you, have, you got a program. Yes, it is something that can be projected as well. This has fallen asleep. Uh, and while that is waiting, am I to take from your previous discussion that there'll be some kind of communication to the Planning Commission? Shall I just summarize the sense of the board? What? Oh, I think that's what you. That, that's what Lee will communicate. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, as this first slide, as this first slide shows, um, there are three proposals, and two of them were uh, advanced following a public hearing on the 14th. One form-based zoning, one historic preservation and review. Thank you. Uh, and then another one was advanced on the 9th. That is what I'm calling Proposal 3, and that's the subdivision. And as we were just discussing, uh, I was suggesting or opening the possibility that 1 and 3 could be handled independently, uh, or 2 could be handled independently from 3. Um, I was going to start very quickly by describing the purpose of the form-based zoning. Uh, you can find the, the purpose statement in Section 2200 point one a and it's basically a set of zoning regulations that emphasizes layout and design far more than conventional zoning does and emphasizes uses uh, less than conventional zoning does but I'm not going to read it you can read it um, it is something that uh, can be downloaded from the internet as well uh, the purpose of these specific changes um, are spelled out here and the intention was to reformat the document uh, and to address some things that were not fully addressed when the first iteration of form-based zoning <coughs> was approved and, and issued. And I'll get into this list a little bit uh, more carefully in just a moment, but you can see um, it is several different topics, several different areas. A little bit of background on form-based zoning is in the regulations as an overlay district. Typically, overlay districts uh, modify the regulations underneath and they're mandatory. You have to follow them. This one is an exception in that it's an optional overlay. You get to, to do it if you want it, but you don't have to do it. It does mean that we have two sets of regulations, and if uh, some members of the Planning Commission show up, they may want to comment on that. Um, we have been um, testing it out over time, and we're constantly having opportunities, and you may hear from one uh, business owner uh, on his experiences about things that could be improved. So a little bit more about what the nature of the changes is. The entire document and the form-based zoning is, is bound separately. It's been reformatted, and it has a, a different numbering system. The regulating plan, which is essentially the zoning map for form-based zoning, that's been updated, and you may recall that there was this issue with a th something we call the frontage zone, and there, were, there, were, there are three currently, and under this proposal, one would be removed. There are some parts of the form-based zoning uh, that have these headers, building form and lot standards, that's been uh, updated. Public realm standards, that's the, those are the standards that apply to the area, basically from the front of the building to the edge of the street. Parking requirements have been updated in different respects, um, not very extensively, but somewhat. Landscaping, screening, lighting have been updated in some respects, not in a huge way. Stormwater, signage. Um, one of the more significant pieces, I think, has to do with previously developed sites. The, the existing ordinances or existing bylaws are pretty silent on it, and we'll talk about that in, in definitions. Um, so I'm going to try to make this more legible, but I just spoke a moment ago about redevelopment or prior development approvals. Um, the existing language is on your left, 
And it says, basically, previously issued approvals, zoning permits and other approvals granted pursuant to the zoning bylaws issued before the effective date of this article shall remain in effect. So, it, and then it refers to the zoning regs. So it basically talks about if you have a site plan approval, it's good for two years. You have a conditional use approval, it's good for two years, and unless you use it. And then when you use it, that approval sticks. But it didn't answer the question, well, what do we do if someone has a PUD approval and they would like to redevelop a portion of their property using form-based zoning. And so on the right, and I'll try to make this a little bit clearer, there is a much more extensive section that explains what happens uh, and makes it very clear that you can basically treat the entire site as though it were um, approved under form-based zoning and you can look at the development potential and then develop a portion of it. So it is, it is um, more clear about how the review process would work for an existing PUD approval as one example. And it does say that conditions of approval that were placed on the, the property in before um, can be revised, but you must satisfy the development review board. Developer, uh, applicant must demonstrate that the conditions to be altered et cetera, uh, will be in conformance with the development and develop, uh, dimensional development standards of this article. So basically someone has to say, yeah, it was a PUD, it's got this thing called the PUD buffer, I'm not gonna follow that anymore, and, and the reason I can get away with doing that is it fully meets the form-based zoning. So that's, that's an example of the kind of change that's incorporated. Um, I think of it as being more of the exception rather than the rule overall because I think of it as being one of the more substantive changes. A lot of the things that were done in the document were somewhat stylistic. They made it read better. They made it clearer. But they didn't change the basic goal. So if I may move on, I'm just going to, uh, well, I'm going to jump ahead to subdivision. So... Um, Right now, the subdivision regulations define certain things as subdivisions, uh, which means they go through a review process. And that definition at present says shopping centers are subdivisions, multifamily housing projects are subdivisions, elderly housing projects are subdivisions, PUDs are subdivisions. And the thinking has, um, has evolved about this requirement that it's really redundant, or at least if it's not redundant, or both redundant and undesirable, it works against what form-based zoning is attempting to do, which is to set a path and tell a developer they can follow it more quickly, and then they actually are able to go through that process more quickly. So what that boils down to is that the Planning Commission has proposed some edits to some definitions of the subdivision regs, and some of them just reflect the fact that the numbering would change, but some of them reflect the fact that uh, they understand that the town would like form-based zoning to be a vehicle for a more streamlined review process, and so one way to accomplish that would be to remove some of the subdivision require remove the subdivision review from form-based zoning projects. That's a simple way of, state, of stating it. Now, the question could occur, and, and I had a conversation with Lee about this, a brief one. You know, this section could have been changed entirely so that no multifamily housing projects were subject to, site, to subdivision review and no shopping centers. It could have been changed more substantially, and I would respond to a question, well, why not, with the answer. The Planning Commission's take on this was it wanted to adjust the regulations so that the goal of having more people use form-based zoning was, um, was moved closer or are moving uh, closer to reaching that goal. And it wasn't to open up a much larger discussion that removing these things entirely would, would raise. So we've covered this in a hearing not, or a public <laughs> meeting not that long ago, so I'm not gonna dwell on it any, any um, or much longer. The extent of the changes to the subdivision regs, as I said, were really just limited to these definitions. Um, now, would you like to stop there and then come back to historic preservation, or do you want to just have me do the presentation quickly and? Just say, keep going. 
go in through the form base changes and then go back to Okay. And I'm design continuing review. to look to see if Jason is here. Oh, okay. Is this on the website? Yes, it is. So if you go to the planning and zoning page, and then on the left-hand side of the planning and zoning page, there is a, I can probably do this by, there's a, a section, planning and zoning updates, I believe it says. And if you go to that, so if we go to, this is coming. So the planning and zoning page, left hand side, zoning and subdivision updates, and these documents, related documents here, form based zoning amendment, the subdivision change text, form based zoning text, and the design review stuff. So all on the right hand side is where people would find these. Um, the form based zoning document is a pretty substantial, I think 20, 20, 22 megabytes or something like that, so it's fairly large. So um, I wasn't going to say really anything more unless there were specific questions. Um, this is the document. It's, it has a different layout, as I said. It's oriented <laughs> in a landscape mode. It's uh, designed to be printed on a larger paper. I think it will be more accessible. This PDF <coughs> projected on a wall doesn't do it justice, really, because it looks very, very dense, but at 11 by 17, it's a lot more, I think, accessible. I'm happy to drill into certain topics if you have questions about them. It is a heap of stuff, I will say. As I was thinking about this meeting, it is a large amount of material. Hats off to all of you for absorbing it. I pour it into my head and part of it runs out um, if I don't keep pouring. Subdivision reg modification. Um, so, if if you mean the other proposal, that would be the design <coughs> review overlay proposal. <coughs> I guess Did, what other than the subdivision definition? Yes. And the changes to the section references. Yep. What else within the form-based zoning well, it's, it proposal is, are we considering? Well, the the unfortunate situation that developed when Brandy Saxon proposed these edits is that she did not prepare a red line version. So it is, um, it is probably 40% of the text was tweaked. So I don't have a red line version pr to project. That's something that could be, you know, we could show you a red line version of a document that Brandy has presented to the Planning Commission up until about three quarters of the way through. But I was, rather than walking people through, it would have taken probably two hours to go, to go through the entire document. The presentation that I have was gonna be pretty high level and in the hopes of people having picked out certain things and then we could go to that section and I could describe, well, what was the discussion and why is it the way that it is? Because without the document having been done in a red line format, I think it's as likely people would have questions about things that were in the original document as in the proposal. And I think it would be fair to answer the question regardless, instead of saying. But you've summarized what you consider the substantive changes. So those, those are the tasks. Now there is a document that I can pull up that will Show this a little bit more. So, and and some of this may, in fact, um, 
pop up in the back of, of Jamie's mind because I think that this is a document that dates to when he was wrapping up on the Planning Commission. So within the regulating plan, <coughs> language was revised to clarify when a new street path or right of way would be required. There's a change that would simplify the scheme that's used for um, future streets. Regulating, and one of the most significant aspects of that is that there's a future street that was uh, currently, is currently in the regs on the southern part of the corridor on the east side where, where there was one design review, uh, one form based zoning application that a neighbor strongly objected to because that form based zoning application had a small segment of a future road, and the people who lived north of it said, Well, road, you know, why are you putting that in? There's never going to be a road here. Um, also, sorry. Oh. So also in the regulating plan, removing building height requirements from the plan. So that document was somewhat cleaned up. Um, I can continue to go through if you'd like to spend the time to do it. Um, revising the character district descriptions to keep them in sync with other parts of the document. Um, under the building forum standards, clarify that only principal buildings need to conform with the building standards. So it's a little bit of an ambiguity in the document. Well, what about garages or what about some small accessory structure? This makes it clear that the building, the building type standard is applied to the principal building. Um, there was a reference, uh, there was, it was anticipated that someday building materials could be required uh, or part of this, and that's been taken out. Uh, public realm standards. So there's some, there is currently some ambiguity about uh, the difference between a street and a dri access drive, and the street types are only going to apply to streets. So that, that ambiguity is addressed. Um, and then there are some specific references that we can pull out. Um, the, this moment, not going to remember them, but we can we can search for them. The uh, parking, um, there is a proposed revision to remove language that says unless an alternative is approved by the DRB. So basically it's saying there shall be bicycle parking as part of this. Uh, landscaping, landscaping, screening, and lighting standards. Um, there are some fairly technical pieces of the form-based zoning that have to do with things like how much soil that plants are put in. And so that is one of the proposed uh, amendments, clarify the soil volume standard. Um, then um, the next change that's listed here, have it reflect that landscaping, um, all parking lots, not just uh, smaller, I'm sorry, all parking lots, not just large parking lots would be subject to certain landscaping requirements. And LID stands for low impact development. So things that would be um, limiting stormwater. Um, and then clarify the difference between low impact development and green stormwater infrastructure and revise as necessary. So that was also done. Some language on rain gardens. Um, spacing requirements were tweaked with Brandy's input. Um, the meaning of uh, clarifying the meaning of abutting parking spaces or stalls, uh, giving some flexibility for using smaller trees underneath utilities and lines makes sense. Um, there were some revisions to planting specifications between evergreens and deciduous trees. Um, and then there were some things that Brandy fixed that had to do with spacing requirements for trees. Um, if there were questions, I could answer them. If we want to keep going, yes. Can I just ask a question about the rain garden being used as to manage runoff from parking lots? <coughs> yes. Um, the fact that they can be used to manage the runoff, does that factor into storm stormwater uh, management at all? Um, so it, it could, is what I would say, because if someone is developing a project and they're designing the, the parking area and they're designing the rain gardens, it's conceivable that that could be one of the ways that they are going. The, the benefits that would be provided by the rain gardens are going to be shown in their stormwater analysis. So, mm -hmm. yes, there's a connection. Okay. I, I don't know that it would be the sort of thing that would, it's not, 
likely in my mind to be a central part because it's not going to be treating large, large volumes. But if someone has a very constrained site and they're needing to wring out every sim, you know, every single gallon that they could, then they would include it. Okay. Did these pass seven zero with the planning commission? Was there? I mean, what was the public input like? How long did? Um, well, the thing about the public input on this is that it goes back a long, long time ago. Yeah. Now, when Brandy prepared her package of changes, um, it was more of a work session. Then the Planning Commission put it uh, to rest for a little while. And then when they came back, they went through several meetings where they themselves, because they had new members who hadn't really been that familiar with it, they weren't, or they weren't involved with it, and they continued to make further changes. Uh, in the process of learning about it. It's, as far as public involvement with it, I would say it was occasional in terms of total numbers of people. I'm hard pressed to say. I, I wouldn't say it was a large number. Yeah. Does this reflect, so we've had what, a handful of applications, right? Under the form based code, does any of this reflect constructive what has input happened? from I, applicants on specifics, for example, window glazing? Right? I'm sorry. What was the last thing you said with respect to window glazing? Does this window, window. body of work reflect input we've received from real form based code applications to date? It was, uh, um, yeah, well, applications are potential applications because I would say Either that or. the changed, the, the, the removal of the, the northern uh, frontage zone, I don't believe would have come up if, if the folks from the bowling alley hadn't come forward with it. It was not something that it would have been, yeah, it wouldn't have come up on its own. So yes, as, as one example. Do you think the document got shorter or longer? Total word count, I believe, got shorter, shorter. but it's, it's, um, it's going to be easier to work with, like I said. It's going to be bulkier because of the paper size. But I think it's gonna be more accessible. I think it will be easier for people to navigate than the okay. current version. Sorry. I'd like to follow up on Jamie's question, Dean, because I, re I recall at the start that you were, there was, there was a, a concomitant effort to track uh, party interest in form-based and, and generate from those discussions uh, needed changes or suggested changes. Uh, would you, be, could you guesstimate the percentage of changes that were sui generis here that just came out, came out of internal reviews and discussions versus uh, those that were generated with some degree of, of, uh, of, of exactitude to, to applicants, potential applicants, reviewers, general commentator over the period of time? Yeah. Just a guesstimate? I, well, I might put it into three categories. I would say um, a third of the, I, of the changes were things that Brandy picked up. I think a third were things that the Planning Commission had um, some idea of. And the final third, I would say, I had it right on the tip of my tongue, um, yeah, it's escaped me. But it's well, the third would be their staff, the input, input for third yes. party stakeholders. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So as a, thank you for that. And as a follow-on question, could you, would you think aloud with us about whether this represents uh, a stage of change or whether this is part of a series that we could expect? I mean, is there? Uh, is there a lot of other stuff that should also happen I in some near point in the future? Is this just a, a point at which we're, 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 we're reviewing these? The, the Planning Commission, when it went through Brandy's document, sorted and it, it broke the options into two choices. Uh, made the, de the decision to say these are things that could be incorporated fairly quickly and we want them to be included now with Brandy's proposal. There are some other things that are just going to be longer discussions and they need to wait for the next iteration. Right, and that's where we are. Yeah, I think, and so. Sorry, go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say, th this is not the end of the story. If, right. if foreign based zoning is, is here to stay, this is not the end of the story. Whether or not the next iteration is uh, truly a revolutionary type document and it's a proposal that replaces the underlying zoning and this gets integrated into the fall, I'm not sure. That would be a big step. But there are some there are some issues that would take more discussion for the group to agree to them. Might it be useful, uh, Lee, to gather up some of those larger questions? The, the most obvious one is: Should form base be mandatory? And in a in a short, brief statement of interest, so that the board could be thinking about larger issues that 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 the plant that we might have uh, 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 some thinking to share with the planning commission about i mean brandy by the way for those of you who wouldn't necessarily know is a professional consultant to the planning commission that's the person that he keeps mentioning <laughs> brandy uh, so there is a there is a list of those larger topics that the Planning Commission didn't incorporate it. Uh, so if the, the select board would like it, I think there was some hesitation to make that part of this presentation or this proposal because the Planning Commission wanted to score a goal. And it, it looked at this proposal as a way of getting the football across the goal line yeah. and, um, and doing it in a reasonable amount of time. I think they were just. No, we're not whistling them off the field. We're just saying, what's in the next half, <laughs> right? Um, yes, I think <laughs> maybe that's the next season. Sing and dance. It's the next you know, season. What are we going to do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And <coughs> just to take the analogy a little further, sure. because you started it. it. How we're awful start, of we're, you. It feels like we're scoring on ourselves a little, right? Because we haven't had a lot of momentum on this yet. So I, I love the idea of iterating on it. When we were on, when I was on the commission, we knew that there would be testing and learning yeah. in this body of work. So this is good stuff that we're improving it, but I feel like it's time to just stop dancing around the decision to address this as an overlay and actually just start examining whether yeah. or not we can it might move this forward three and, years. because yeah. it's not working. In my opinion, we, it's been out there for a couple of years and Developers are choosing to stick with old zoning yeah. versus form base. So, to me, that tells me there's just more work to do. Yeah, my 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 take on this is that some of the communities that have used form based zoning and commercial corridors like this have, um, after they've adopted it, they've and not done it like we did it optionally, um, have realized that they need to be be very. Um, they have to question their standards and they have to question uh, their waivers because some of the standards that are in here and in other form-based zoning documents are the result of recommendations from pro professional consultants. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. And communities that have done these types of things in commercial quarters have found that they butt up against um, things that people hadn't thought about and that really the number, it shouldn't be one to nine, it should be one to three, or it shouldn't be limited to 20%, it should be 40%. That there are standards that just aren't the right standards and that they don't need to be as tight as they are in the first iteration. And then the other area, and it comes, uh, it gets tricky because the execution is important, is the waivers. So when you have these standards and you're gonna loosen them, how does that play out when you also allow waivers? You need to be talking about the two things together because the more generous you are with waivers, the less important the standards yeah. become. Yeah. But it's, that's a big discussion. And I would hesitate to recommend that you go to it's the law of the land unless you're comfortable with either the standards or the waivers. Because I mean, that's why I asked if we had developer input on this because yeah. well, that will tell us if yeah. well, it feels over-engineered or if it well, I can tell is you, flexible I think that it's, It it's, doesn't feel flexible it, enough it's, based on it, anecdotal input. Yeah, it's people, people, including some of the members of the Planning Commission, I think felt that the first version uh, presupposed a level of, uh, uh, a strength in the retail market that doesn't exist, or is it's those days have passed, and so there are requirements that 
um, are there that probably shouldn't be there given the realities of the retail market. So that's yeah, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. Yeah, but we but see the, a lot of development happening in South Burlington, yeah. right north of us on the corridor, but it's not happening here yeah. for some reason. Yeah. But but the thinking of some who are seeing things that way was to remove the requirements for active ground floor uses, and that's you know that is a mindset that some people have that the world has changed. Yeah, I thought, yeah. So so that's something that could take a little bit of discussion. But I think we're having, you know, I'd like to untangle a couple of issues. One is, how do we make this a user-friendly document? The other is, how do we get rid of, you know, inconsistencies? And then, you know, or, or you know, sort of citational errors. I mean, there's that whole set that's of not, issues. That's not the problem. The citation error, I mean, those are things that we're... We're looking at. We're looking at right now. Yeah, but, but those are sort of not really what we're talking about here, which is how do we make this implementable in a much more effective way. And even there, we have the issue of existing zoning versus form-based zoning. So how do we separate issues? I mean, it would be a, an entirely different document if we didn't, if it were, obviously, if it were required, if it were the law of the land, the issues we'd be trying to uh, sort through here, I think, would be very different. So, you know, when I'm looking at this, I'm trying to get a grip on what is the way to make this, you know, user-friendly, applicable, um, easily implemented. Um, and then there's all these other issues, you know, yeah. ab about. And, and the challenge I think the Planning Commission has found is that, you know, in, in defining user-friendly uh, or user-friendliness, you raise issues that go to the heart of form-based zoning, things like, well, we, we went down this path because we wanted the development to look a certain way. We were going to tell people they could do more development, but the price to do it would be to <coughs> develop the way that we think we want to develop. And the way that we thought we think that we want to develop is those building standards, or those building types, and those street types, uh, things like that. And when you actually use the regulations, you start to ask yourselves, well, are those the right street types? You know, do, do we really want to tell people that they have to be that close to the road? I mean, the, the logic of form-based zoning is to bring the buildings closer. And the discussions that, some of the, uh, that have been made at some of the planning commission meetings are really about not making people bring the buildings so close, or at least in certain places having the flexibility to make an argument. So that's pretty central. So do we mean it? We want to bring buildings closer? Or do we think it's less important? And that would be a pretty significant change. Right. Well, we didn't, uh, we, we kind of interrupted your, your process here, which uh, uh, so will, will along, encourage you to resume. But I think in the, in the meantime, Lee, it's a clear interest on our parts, uh, certainly to, to, to be, become familiar with the uh, the list that Dean has described, and uh, with your help, maybe decide how best to approach What's that. What's the list? As, you know. What is the list? What is the what? You keep referring to. What's the list? Which um, you had a the planning commission. You described a list, list oh, of so, issues. Yeah, so there's, I'm, I'm Big using that phrase to say that they have identified the topics that are that were too big, yeah. that include things like the, the ones that I was just mentioning. Yeah to be included in this proposal. They would have slowed this process down too much. Yeah. They wanted to forward a proposal to you so that it was Well, it was I think that track. would be a, a good step for us. Yeah. Uh, I realize we're, you know. But, but just for my own clarity, we're, and I know we've, we've, this is our second or third time, these are issues about the functionality of our current form-based zoning. So. We need, I mean, I feel like I need to focus on that. Yes. Then we have this other yeah, issue. Exactly. Right, about the bigger picture. Yeah, exactly. And I'd like to sort of keep those two things separate so we can, you know, yeah. like, let's get, let's let's do this. If And everything, you know, everything seems good as far as Before I understand. The first call. Yeah. yeah. And then, here you go. Yeah. Um, um, is there an opportunity for public input? Could you? Yeah. Could you uh, identify yourself yeah. in the mic for our audience at home? And so I guess there is opportunity for public input. Yes. Yes, why don't you there, identify there yourself <laughs> for our audience at home? Go to it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dean. 
Um, my name is Anthony Sedita. I'm a resident at 223 Summit Circle in Shelburne. Um, Dean presented a lot of changes to the current uh, Shelburne Road form-based overlay. And I'm curious, those changes, Dean, you had a slide that had the bullet points with a lot of the priorities. Are we voting tonight on those changes going into effect without really knowing what the priorities mean specifically? Does that make sense? Well, this is a, a public hearing on the proposal. So I'm... I'm, I'm asking, Dean, no Dean is showing to... there's a lot of changes to the current Shelburne Road form-based overlay, uh, right. zoning form-based overlay. Yeah. And he had a slide that had a number of different uh, bullet points. No. Nature of changes. Yes, that one right there. So there's those changes are more specific in the current. Is it Article 22? Is that correct, Dean? Yes, it would okay. become. So those changes will be made to Article 22. Are you going to be voting tonight to say, okay, whatever he said those changes are, we're going to say go ahead and make those changes. That's what I'm trying to understand the flow here. Is that? We may. Do you have okay. on specific? What I'd like to know is, do you have the current Article 22 with the red lines of everything that specifically is going to be changed? And how are you going to make no, a decision no. when it's this broad? Because that building form and lot standards clarified and update, that could mean 101 different things. Parking oh, yeah, requirements, yeah. that can mean a lot of different things. So I'm curious how you guys would make the, your best informed decision when only knowing broad 20,000 foot overview of what, the, what that means to the changes. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that was partly why I asked if the commission had adopted this unanimously. I mean, as you can appreciate, it took them 18 months, probably 12 months, to to get this over to us. So for us to go through this at a word by word level just isn't realistic. So to the extent you have specific input I, on I mean, changes it, that you're aware of, it, it, please depending on tell how, us because how substantial those changes are. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of the projects that take place on Route Seven. It's so broad. Who really knows? And I just find it weird that you guys wouldn't be more invested in what the details are before you vote yay or nay to make those changes to the current form-based overlay. It just, it's, it's bewildering that he can run through a presentation and you just kind of put the best faith in the Planning Commission would, when you're supposed to vote and have a little bit more information on what it means. That's, that's what I'm saying. No, it's okay. I mean, stay at the mic. I, I'm, yeah. I'm interested in what the input is because I, yeah. I do put a lot of faith yeah, no, in that no, commission, I, I, and they're, I'm, there's I'm a just, reason why we have them is because they're the subject matter experts. If I was sitting in your seat, and I know you know there's a lot of changes, I would still want to know the specifics on what a little bit more yeah. what it means before you sign off on it to say, yeah, I vote yeah or nay. Yeah, which part, we can I do. We had a red line version because that's what this looks like. Uh, yeah, it does look like there are red line areas. I think there are just... And so those those colors are. Uh, That's just are, the color. Yeah, those are colors to things. There. Right. It's yeah. more like hypertext. Yeah. Those are not. Those are not red line yeah, changes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate that she did it in, in a red said format. At the beginning of this presentation is we from Brandy we have seventy five percent of the um, whole red line version is complete and you mentioned that if we wanted that we could have it but most of those were. Um, grammatical changes, and he highlighted the three major issues right, at the very beginning. So here's my thing. You say yes to something, not knowing fully what it means. <laughs> a building goes up that turns out not to be a, a positive project, and it's, that's irreversible. That building's there to stay. Yeah, we can change it down the road, but that building's there to stay until it basically falls down. Um, so these are major decisions that are being made for the future of Route 7. And I would, if I was in your position, I would want to know exactly what those changes mean. Go back to that slide one more time, Dean, please. Thank you very much. Some of those look like some pretty big, heavy-hitting items right there. Building form and lot standards, clarified and updated. I'd want to know exactly what that means. Um, regulating plan, frontage zone removed. I mean, that means, you know, for certain properties that are supposed to have retail commercial on the first floor, that's off the table. As a resident who lives close to Route 7, I'd like to know that you know, if, if a new community is going up, I'd like to be part of that community where I can go to the coffee shop on the first floor and meet the people who live there and get to know, you know, that community as opposed to it's just an apartment building tucked back where they're secluded by themselves on Route 7 because they're not going to walk to the supermarket. It's way too far in either direction, east or west, north or south, actually, if you're talking about Route 7. Um, there's a lot of things to consider, and it's too broad to just go through each one. Some of them signage. I don't think that keeps me up at night. That's not something, you know, I mean, it could be a neon sign, who knows, but 
I, I think those are some big items that I would want to know exactly what they mean as opposed to just a really quick rifle through presentation. Well, to be fair, this is the second time that we've mm -hmm. gone through this. So the frontage, I remember our discussion, and the building form and lot standards, I remember that the, the changes were not sub There are changes to things like uh, the elevation of the ground floor and whether or not the building has to be, the first floor has to be at least one foot or two feet up. Right. And change that so it could be as low as zero because that makes it easier for people to provide accessibility. Right. So my, my point is, you're describing these as huge changes, and so I'm could taking... Potentially. Well, I, my belief is that they're not, because we've actually had these conversations. Now, to the point, you know, I, I guess the point I want to make is this is kind of how it works. Our commissions bring to us their best due diligence in presenting a project. We look at it. We evaluate it. But I don't think it's my job to kind of go through hearing, and we have a public why. hearing, no, too, which is what tonight. we're doing. I, I, I'm kind of uh, yeah. anally retentive and a little bit type no, A where no, that's why. I go through no, no, that's uh, why we have it's important to understand line by line the process. and I check it out and I right. still keep a ledger for my checkbook at home. Probably not a lot of people do that. You yeah, know, no, that's, that's good. Yeah. So I wonder, is there a way for us to sort of find some middle ground on this to get some type of a little more detail on a summary? I mean, we could all review this code against old code, but it's well, it's a big task, yeah. right? For we had talked one about individual that. to do that, and some planning commissions for it. and that's why we have the planning commission. So I'm just wondering if you have specifics, it would be helpful for us to react to. But short of that, it sounds like you don't want to. No, no, it's provide not specifics, that. It's, or you may not know true. exactly. I don't what. know, Dean. Yeah. So I guess I should ask Dean. Let's let's let someone else finish their thought, if you would mind. Yeah, no, I understand what he's saying, moment. be a little yeah. bit more specific. Yeah, just yeah. I mean, that, that would be helpful. That way we can react to it and sort of look at specific sections and yeah. then figure out, you know, whether there's a scenario that is a real world example that may be an issue for others, not just you. Right, so it, it sounds like uh, I put the real world examples forward as opposed to knowing what the real world examples are from his side. So it's just, I don't know all the real world examples. But my yeah. question would be, Dean, if, um, a developer has the option before the form-based zoning to use what, traditional zoning? Right. What, it, it sounds like the form-based zoning makes it more challenging for them to get a project through. Is that correct? In the overlay? That's, it all depends. Well, that's the issue. <laughs> it, it sounds like we built this thing with the cards kind of in our hand, and because it's not working, now we're looking to strip it down to make it easier for development. And I don't know if that's in the best interest of the community. Yeah, because no, then not, once you strip it down, developers are going to do the least that they can to get it through. And then, like I said, once those decisions are made, it's irreversible where, you know, then we're, we're looking at the cart yep. in front of the horse. Yep. Yeah, I've that's got a couple, of, I think we couple of responses here. for you that may be a little helpful. First, it's to let you know that much, much of what we do is consequential. Much of what we do as a consequence and, and is given consideration in those very terms. We're very much aware that we're a very temporary, a very temporary function here by, by individual. There will be others and other boards and, and there will be potential changes and some decisions that have been made may not turn out the way we anticipated first. Second, uh, it, what's very helpful, I found in reviewing all this material and we've had it for some time, Mm -hmm. is that I didn't feel I had any dog in the hunt. I didn't feel anything that jumped out at me that, that said, gee, this doesn't seem to make sense, or this should be strengthened, or this should be weakened, or what was the rationale? All of us in our various ways have reviewed this with, with I'm, I'm guessing, a similar kind of point of view. Third, we, the way we're structured in, in the town is that we have specific uh, committees, commissions, boards who are charged with most of these decisions. I'm not suggesting that the select board is just a rubber stamp or in some way an inconclusive, you know, uh, formality. But the planning commission has spent, and most of us are aware, a great deal of time with this in some, in some detail. And it would be, I think, our default that the commission recommendation is a more learned and more informed one 
than, than our own, mm -hmm. unless, again, something had really jumped out at you. I think the questions that you're raising about the philosophy of regulation are a little removed from the specifics of the proposal. And I hope you get some confidence from a prior discussion, which we're all about, the philosophy of regulation. That was exactly what we were talking about in terms of, of, of generating this list of big picture lists, call it. Because uh, it seems to me some of your, some of your input re, uh, re, re, could refer specifically to that, particularly the question about the cafe on the ground floor, which is the case in South Burlington with a form-based zone building. And uh, at that point, we, we'd hope you would come back and give us your point of view. Meantime, what would be really helpful would be to get some specifics from you about a particular requirement or, or definition. I realize that's asking a lot of you, and you must then go through the material that we have. Uh, I, I apologize in advance, but that would be the most helpful thing to us at the moment. Thank you, Jerry. Yep. I appreciate that feedback, and I will. And my final question, I guess, to put the... Uh, uh, my, you know, my question would be to Dean, do any of these proposed amendment changes in any way, shape, or form make it any easier for the current proposed project being planned at the Champlain Lanes Bowling Alley for the developer to go through with that project? Some, some would say that, yes, one of the changes is going to make that project more feasible, and that is the removal of the frontage zone, the northern frontage zone. Which has already been approved. But this might not relate to the 33 versus 24 unit question that you've raised? Correct. There is not a, there is, that is not a change that's been made. And how about as the part setback of this as far as how far it's set back or forward? Is that there, the, the build two zone was also not changed as part of this. The the f removal of the frontage zone has has a change, but it's still there's still the build two zone requirements in ex in place, and they were not relaxed in response to that project concept that's been floated. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We'll be in we'll be in touch. Thank you. Absolutely. With apologies to you, Chris, and and. I know we're running now uh, against your uh, against the timetable, so, but and and I I'm, I'm happy I'm Jason's still not here. I mean I want to be um, pragmatic about it. Personally, I feel no urgency to the board uh, uh, acting tonight. I, I just wanted to recap that the lack of a 100% uh, red line is something that was mentioned early on. It's unfortunate, um, but there wasn't a way to turn back the clock. We. Um, the point was made as well that one sort of justification uh, that it's a benefit is that you all need to be comfortable with this document. And so even if there's something that predated the, it is not strictly speaking a proposed edit, if it should be changed, it should be changed. It could be changed and it would go back to the planning commission, they would consider the change and you want another hearing and it's changed. Um, and I would be happy to share the, what I would call loosely this a 75% red line. It will be somewhat helpful for some people just need to understand its limitations. It was a document that Brandy Saxton maintained parallel with the work that she was doing, but then after a point she just stopped and then did everything in her desktop publishing. Happy to circulate that. We didn't do it because it wasn't complete. As long as people understand that it's not complete. And maybe circulate that and continue this hearing for is it is it uh, possible to get a list of what you would consider grammatical reference type changes versus changes I mean is that a distinction that uh, a edits versus you mean, yeah. yeah edits versus substantive changes to the actual regulatory framework of form based zoning is there is there a, a list, there's not a list but is it possible to distinguish those I don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, finding new aligning references. That doesn't seem to be hugely important. But I am, I would like to actually know what will substantively impact the actual zoning changes. I mean, this is a good list, but it would be nice to see that in the document yeah. so that I could go yeah. look at it 
and see what that actually entails. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I think that, um, again, it, um, we can generate a list. I think that in terms of substantive changes, things that are that have major implications, they include the language that I started out with, which has to do with redevelopment of existing sites, because that will um, that will be a very significant uh, incentive, I think, for, for people to use form-based zoning. And that means that some sites where people have already developed, they could develop even more. So infill, which is a big part of form-based zoning, right. could happen as a result. I think we haven't talked much about it, but there are changes to stormwater. The stormwater requirements are greater than what the um, underlying zoning requires, and the the um, Planning Commission has given a lot of thought to the idea of making the stormwater requirements in the underlying zoning match form-based zoning, which would make it tougher for people. They wouldn't be able to um, avoid them by going to the traditional zone. Mm. So those are a couple of areas that I think are very substantive. Um, the regulating plan change to remove the frontage zone is probably the third significant policy decision that's being made. And it's not only because it's one of three that's being removed, it's because, well, how important is it really? Because the second, well, there are three of them, it'd be going down to two, and one of the three that, or one of the two that would remain is at the intersection near the, the commons, and that's where healthy living is going in. And, and the fate of that area may be determined. So, uh -huh. you know, how, how important are those, how important is the frontage zone concept? And right now, the Planning Commission is comfortable saying, eh, that northerly one, we can, we can live without. Okay. So, so it seems at the moment we're agreeable to continue the hearing to the yes. 25th, first. I think we yeah. should continue it. Yeah. Please. Hey there, uh, my name is Clint West. I'm a Shelburne resident, and I may be he is. the only one that can speak to Fort May zoning. Um, I am building 2916 Shelburne Road across from the Shelburne Meat Market currently. And I will say from my own experience, I think that I would rec make the recommendation. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me how I could pick between one zoning and the other zoning. And, and the most obvious example is I have a road that I, you come in Clearwater, Palmer, uh, I'm off of Shelburne Road, and you turn into my property behind the building, and I have a road that currently goes to a property that I don't own. And if they come in, because it's for sale, if they come in and say, I want to use old zoning, I have complete infrastructure. Um, here we go. Thanks, Dean. Um, I have complete infrastructure that essentially serves no purpose. Um, but you had it there. This is the yeah. previous condition. The buildings are gone, and this is Clint's approved plan. Oh, this is a version of it to just yes. give you the sense. So, you know, I have a road you know, that I'm paying to pave, I'm, I'm landscaping, I've done the landscape architects, I've done the, the light, I've done everything, and if the lot to my uh, south chooses to not use form-based zoning, I just kind of have a weird deal there that I could, you know, maybe add, maybe I could have added a couple parking spaces, but it's private right now. So I think that going to one or the other makes complete sense. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up with this all over the road, and you're already going to have that because of the stuff that's existing. So, so that's just one thing. Um, my latest. Um, so, so I have a couple of small things I'll just throw out there, and I'll and, and forgive me. I talked to Dean this morning and. Uh, email yesterday with Lee this and I actually just found out about this like I don't know three o'clock today or one o'clock that this was going on so I think that there's some other considerations that need to be looked at prior to approval and um, so I on the BTZ zone I am at the front of it and so I'm literally five feet from the sidewalk 
And oh, yes, do you want to? That'd be a great picture. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I didn't want to steal this thunder. Yeah. Um, so, one of my concerns <laughs> is that. So, by allowing <coughs> buildings that close, number one, there's. I am in a bus stop, so that's a. There's, I don't know, five feet closer than the average person is because they got to swoop in. But just the state plows alone are showering my building. And it's actually a little disheartening to think that I'm investing this and the, the, the town hasn't even come by and we own a snow plow and, or a snow blower. And I don't know where, you know, it's not going in the street and it's not going, it hits my building. So we've got an issue on our hands and this is one of them. So, and uh, to boot, you know, there is um, another guy that turns, one guy in particular that, tur that turns out of there that even before I built this was always like, oh, trim that bush. And like, so this is, um, I think you could see personally far enough, um, but when it comes to pull out. So again, I am in a bus stop area, so it's back a little bit, so this is an issue and it's an issue that I emailed Lee about and I would like to have as a property owner, I would like a, a response or a guarantee or something to know how this is going to be taken care of. Um, I've, I know most of the guys on the, the road crews and it's like there's literally like you have to either load it or I don't, I don't know. So there's a problem. Um, also, um, I'm concerned about all the plantings that, uh, um, I mean, the state can't even keep trees along the corridors alive. And the regs say that I have to replace stuff, you know, as it dies, which is acceptable. But when it's in this environment, what, what is acceptable? Because I can't do that every year, you know. And um, so those are, um, th those are the, the, I would say the main thing, and, and I am worried, like, you know, they require, uh, with my building type, which is a mix, uh, mixed use building, it requires 40% glass, which costs a fortune on that building. <laughs> so just, you know, if a, a plow is going down the road and picks up, I don't know, someone's muffler or something, that's some random thing that's on the road, you know, like, like, I just, I feel like there's some issues there that, need to be addressed and it may it may be as I discussed with Dean it may be something as simple as instead of five feet from the um, right of way which in my case is almost the edge of the sidewalk because it because it, it bumps in there you know it could be you know seven and a half feet something just just enough to make a difference and um, I just wanted to bring this to everyone's attention I don't know I would like to personally, um, because I'm probably familiar or more familiar with these regs from this project, um, and I didn't know about this, and I, this project was behind me. I'm in building mode now, so I'm not really studying those anymore. But I, I would love to, um, you know, the one that was brought up that I, I haven't looked at yet is, so signage. I, di I didn't look at that, but I have a plan for signage, so am I grandfathered in? Under old, like, is it going to affect, you know, I have a whole plan and, um, and that hasn't been submitted yet. Um, everything else has been approved, but my signage hasn't been approved. So I'd like to look at it. Um, I don't want to delay things, but I, I think it, um, it warrants taking a look. And so I guess I am the only one that could have give you real world experience. And there you go. <laughs> that's what you got. For yeah. Yeah. So, for yeah. Coming in and so providing that input. That's uh, that's the kind of recognition for a new business, Maple Leaf Cleaners, that we didn't anticipate <laughs> earlier tonight. But yeah. But we welcome you first yeah. in that regard, and secondly, uh, this is again the, to a point that the previous gentleman's made that there are consequences to decisions. And here's a real world case, uh, like the cafe further down the road across from Panera, and, uh, uh, and the optical building that's on uh, Dorset across from uh, Healthy Living, uh, and, and look, which looked pretty crowded too with snow uh, the other day. So 
We appreciate it. We'll keep you advised, and we encourage you to, to continue discussions with Dean and, and Lee, and uh, we'll certainly, we'll certainly <coughs> hope you'll return uh, should we continue the hearing, which it sounds like my colleagues wish we, will wish we do, uh, back on the 25th. Okay. Thank you. We thank you. Thank you for making the effort to come, and welcome. My sense is that uh, if everyone's agreed, given the time at this point, that we continue the hearing. It sounds as if we've got uh, a reorganization of it to, uh, with, with everybody's benefit in mind, including uh, presentation. We thank you, Dean. Sure. I know it's an awful lot of material for you to manage at the same time. Uh, we thank you, sir, for your input. And please come back on the 25th. And if you have questions in between, please don't hesitate to to ask us, and we'll see if we can measure to your degree of, of uh, diligence, okay? So, two suggestions, if I may. One is uh, we need a motion to recess this Correct. hearing. Correct. But also remembering that we also warned yes. the other hearing on the historic preservation. Correct. Design and new piece with, of it. with Chris's indulgence, should we could spend a few more minutes to do that. Fine. Okay. In which case, is there a motion to continue this hearing to February 25th? Moved. moved by Jamie. I'll second. Seconded by Mike. Any further discussion? Yes. We will be having. Um, Shorthanded. Yeah. So I, I don't know if we, Jamie, if that, if, since you won't be at that meeting, if that, if it makes sense for us to move it to another date. The so that, okay with that. Yeah. yeah. We also yeah, do have this. We do have It'll the give us more time to review this as yeah. well. I that think. seems a very good point. Fe March 10th? March yeah, 10th. I would say March 10th. That's a really good idea. I was going to suggest that as well. <laughs> oh, March 24th. <laughs> I won't be here on the 10th. I'll participate by phone, but this is March something. 24th. Is there any reason not to do it then? Thank you, and I'm sorry. 24th. March 24th will we'll, we'll change the... That's a great <laughs> idea, really. Yeah, okay. And we are voting now on continuation to a date certain, March 24th. Is there a, there was a second? Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And while there's an opportunity to mention it, because our colleague, Colleen, who is presently the senior serving member of the select board, uh, is not running for re-election, as many of you know, and will not be able to attend our next meeting on the 25th. So this is her last uh, formal go-round, and our last opportunity to meet with her as a, as a bunch of friends and, and uh, occasionally people who've gotten some things done. Uh, but we, everyone can know that we do have something planned for town meeting, in which case uh, we have Colleen's assurance that she's going to be there, and uh, you can uh, stay tuned. So, but meanwhile, we do all of us uh, down deep are uh, sorry and we'll miss her and uh, uh, we're happy to have at least this meeting to remember and and Colleen can remember everything she's going to miss on the 25th. So. <laughs> Nothing's okay. as good a send off as aerial skiing. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we'll uh, entertain a motion to uh, open the hearing in the second case, correct? Thank you. Would you help with that language since a uh, motion to open the hearing on the proposed changes, the other proposed historic changes to the zoning related to review of historic preservation yes. and design review. Lee's provided us some, some, some text. Is there a, a motion to that effect? So moved. Mary moves. A second. I'll second. Mike seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. So this we will now. Copies, yeah, thank you, Dean. You can keep that uh, copy, by the way. Oh. Oh, it's back? Yes, it's oh, back. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you had just immediately decided that you were going to No, we couldn't stand. I think we were just going to try to do it. Quickly. We didn't get nearly enough of you. So I'm we're, sorry. If you think that's acceptable, if not, then. 
Uh, Would you recommend that we put it off to the 24th, Dean? Not that we're in a hurry, but... Uh, it's okay waiting until... <laughs> it's, it's really the pleasure of the board. I'm happy to talk about it. What, what, why don't we do it on the 24th, given the hour? Let's do that, yeah. On March. Yeah. yeah. I agree. In which case, let's, let's rapidly... So we uh, just open the hearing. Continue. <laughs> we can have a motion we'll to recess continue it. Continue it yeah. to yeah. a date yeah. certain, yeah. March 24th. Yeah. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. That colony moves. And a number of people second. Let's choose Jamie. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. But that hasn't. And again, thank you, Dean. Yes, it'll no. save the, Oops, the effort really comes in in the production of the document. So that's helpful to do it once. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for those of you who made uh, input. We appreciate that, and we'll see you back on the 24th. The next item following is a proposed stormwater ordinance and credit manual. This is the second reading of, of the so-called municipal utility, and Chris is here prepared, and Lee is going to introduce. What, what did I do with the stormwater ordinance? We have it. I, yeah, I don't know what I did with my... So I will just give you a very brief high-level overview again, as we did last time, of the proposed changes which have been unanimously endorsed by the Stormwater Committee. Uh, so as you recall, there was a change from the first ordinance to the second as to how we would assess single-family residential properties. We'd have a two-tier approach based on a one-acre threshold of impervious surface. Non-single-family residential properties are assessed based on a more site-specific analysis. There are far fewer of those properties. They tend to be larger and much more realistically subject to that kind of uh, satellite imagery-based assessment. In order to help lessen sticker shock, we are proposing to phase in the stormwater utility fees over a three-year program. First year would be 33 percent, second year 66, and the third year would be the full boat in. And again, as noted before, the hope is then that the amount of money that's presently being carried by the tax base itself, just property taxpayers, would start to decrease as the stormwater utility fees phase in. We did also make changes to the credits that are potentially achievable. So the education credit was increased from 10 percent to 20 percent. Agriculture increased from 25 to 45 percent, and those were intended to address concerns raised by some major landowners in town. If, one question I had is if you're going to increase those credits, won't you likely decrease the amount of money that comes in so that your numbers have to change there? Those are the numbers, those numbers are the same as they were when we saw this previously when the credits were smaller, if I recall correctly. Maybe I'm wrong about that. It is true that if landowners are able to earn credits, that then they would be paying less into the utility. That so is, wouldn't that 206 then change for what you see coming into the general fund from 33 percent? And then well, the 206 is what we're is coming in based on property taxpayers. Yeah. Okay. Not the amount. Okay. The yeah. 170 there. is what's. Yes. presumed would come in. Right. Wouldn't that change? Thank you. And it may need to come in. These are still, it's all a work in, in progress. The reality is not every landowner is going to be able to earn those credits or may not earn them right away because there is work to be done. You can't just come in and say, sure. I'm doing education, I deserve 20 percent credit, or I'm doing agriculture, I get a 45 percent credit. Yeah, I'm thinking about the... <clears throat> On the other hand, the balancing of that is these the numbers proposed to come in to do work is premised on the town having to do all these projects to address stormwater concerns raised by state and federal agencies but if many landowners are managing stormwater better on their own properties then we may have less that we have to do to lessen our stormwater and phosphorus flow into the lake so it may not be direct linear relationship Credits earned means more money has to be brought in. And my concern, though, not to belabor it, and I'm sorry, but my concern is that the state won't be more lenient, that um, big property owners that are um, not industrial but 
uh, not residential, such as the museum and the farm. Institutional. Yeah. Thank you, that's the word. Um, will engage in these educational things, which is all great, and I'm all for it, because I struggled with the idea of a big fee on those folks who are nonprofits and that kind of thing. But I worry then that it's going to put a, the residential owner in a position of paying more in the end. And that's a concern that I had when I looked at this. I mean, hopefully not, but um, right. it's possible that uh, the expenses, in, that we will have to raise that utility fee by virtue of the goodness that's being done by others because the state might not be in sync with that goodness, if you follow. Well, Which is a risk, right? Am I right about it, that? It's all a risk. Okay. And there's no perfect predictability in this. Your concern is understandable. So again, total maximum credit theoretically increased to 75%. The practical likelihood of any one entity actually earning that is probably <coughs> quite slim. And again, we know how much money roughly we need to raise overall. We're con still carrying the certain amount on the tax base, an estimated amount to come in through utility fees, and again, phasing it in over time. Currently, residential is intended as a flat rate. The average for a single family residential home would be less than $100 a year, as currently projected. So we're trying to balance affordability and need. And again, just big picture, the reason we are proposing utility is it's an all-in program that all properties are generating some amount of stormwater, all properties are contributing, and it's not just being carried by the property taxpayers themselves. And there are three components to it. There's the ordinance, the credit manual, and then a separate companion technical standards, which are the standards that would address how do I earn credits, especially on the water quality side. And just by way of information, any landowner with more than three acres of impervious has to go through a permitting process anyway, separate and irrespective from us. The good news is what they do for that should help them earn the credits. credits. And Chris is certainly our local expert, and as you know, we've been working with Tom DiPietro in South Burlington, who's been a huge assistance in this and will continue to be. I think this was a good compromise. I don't think that was proposed last year when we decided that the ordinance wasn't ready for. Credit. No. Yeah. No, this was the amount. There were credits. The amount. Of the oh, credits not the credits. The oh. the phasing. The phasing. Yeah, the phasing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was, was a new one time concept, agreed. That was concept, concept to try to, to sort of let them get consensus. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Agreed. That was a good idea. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that. It's clear a lot of hard work has been done. Thank you. That's my presentation as far as a second reading. Questions on anybody's part? This is the second reading. The actual hearing has been warned for next meeting. For our next meeting, yeah. the 25th. Yeah. Any, any questions, questions coming in from the public, There's Chris? Yeah. Anybody okay. interested in this topic at all? No? no? People just not paying attention, you think? Or? Yeah. They will when they get their bill. They get their right. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get ahead of that a little bit. I hope we are generally as. Well, it'd be good at town meeting to. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 maybe uh, it's too late. It, some right? information. Yeah, that's super high table. level. Uh, hand, some handouts. We <coughs> talked about that. Right. You know, some public outreach. And maybe we should send a, a faux bill to everybody for a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. From Mary. Why a faux bill? Well, because it wouldn't be ready, right? But it, it would get everyone's attention. Yeah, sure so would. this is sure your stormwater yeah. runoff yeah. bill. It might pad the budget to begin with because people would probably think it was real and just send it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really. I, uh, I've had I've had two people actually contact me in regards to the to the, the whole stormwater stuff, but most of it was just clarification is what they were looking for. So yeah. yep. um, didn't really express too much concern. It was more just clarification. Thank you. Do we want to consider having a hearing on this after town meeting and we can raise it? Just a thought. What, do we have a date set for the hearing? Colleen 25th. favors it. We warned one for the 25th, but, but we could recess it, <laughs> continue it to another date. After we'll, have, we'll have plenty of other work to do. Idea. but Well, we could do it the 10th. Uh, it, the, the new board may, may not be too happy about loading up all right. on the 24th, but we could do it March 10th from the 24th. 
which would allow the opportunity at town meeting for questions and mm -hmm. reactions and uh, actually questions on the floor. Yeah, and maybe spur would that make sense a little to bit more conversation on yeah, I think that's a good idea. Forum. It would mean, though, Lee, that you would have to be prepared, I think, with this little summary to explain it to folks. Sure. We'd have yeah. to yeah, fit, fit it in the agenda. Yeah. But this is broken down, I think, in a pretty understandable way, especially with your explanation, I think. It can come in a number of ways. Remember, we put it in the in the uh, select board report. We, we, we referred mm -hmm. to it. Uh, anyone with... Uh, uh, was reviewing the budget. We'll see obvious changes. So the questions could come from another uh, I think even number of directions. The deck that you presented yeah. initially will just help anchor people on this is stormwater. Yeah. This why is what's changing. Why we're doing yeah. the sort of pros to. and cons of each approach, and then let people Will at least start to digest. Do we have the time to make the change between now and the twenty fourth by charter? It's two two weeks, right? So the change on the for agenda it. for. For a town meeting well there's always that Could other business to come before the body right. i'm okay. sorry in what terms I was of questioning is we've established a a, a a decision point on february 24th do we have enough do we have charter time enough to move that to the 10th you could just continue it no we would more. need to do like we did for the zoning hearing we'd open the hearing begin it and recess it to whatever date. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just continue it. Right. So we'd continue the hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we we do have we can do that. Yeah, I think that would be yeah. prudent to yeah, do that. Like that. Yeah. At this point. I think point. we all agreed on that. We, uh, I don't feel like we're getting enough attention on this yet. I think everybody in this room has a good handle on it, but that yes. doesn't convince me that. Yep. Yeah. The broader community appreciates. We've what's had happening, the advantage so. of a year and a half of this yeah. now. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Too. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The next item is to review. This is item 12. Is to review uh, and approve proposed projects for wastewater system analyses and stormwater management. Uh, Chris has a, men a copy of our mem memo from Chris, which has a few more bits of detail than did uh, Lee's. Uh, uh, Especially where the gravel yard was, and, and <laughs> some detail on dollars. But do you want to review that quickly? And um, if you if you don't mind, I'd like to jump to number two, which is sure. which is Wayne, which is why Wayne Elliott is here. Oh, okay. Um, that way we can get him out of here at a reasonable time. So, and we appreciate you being <laughs> patient. I'm Ten minutes away, so it's not a big deal. So that's the facility consolidation uh, preliminary engineering review. Um, just to kind of cue things up for for Wayne, we, uh, as you're aware, we have a facility that was upgraded back in 2000. Um, it's it's hit its 20 year life expectancy, um, mostly for the equipment and the SCADA system and all that stuff. So. Um, it's in the pro in, at this time is when you'd start looking at doing some sort of an upgrade. Um, we hired Hoyle Tanner and Associates to do the do some analysis on what our options would be. Um, and I don't know if you recall, but we looked at option number one, which was keeping the two facilities and upgrading both of those. And the other option was you know caught, turning one into a pump station and upgrading the other to. Uh, to consolidate to one location. And then the fourth option was to send the flow to South Burlington, turning everything we have here into pump stations. Um, we've hired uh, Aldrich and Elliott to look at this in a little bit further depth. We've also, at, um, just to put another set of eyes on it also uh, and stuff, because this is a big decision for the town. Um, so. I'll let Wayne just briefly uh, discuss, um, you know, the project and what we're what we're planning on doing. So, okay. uh, good evening. So, Chris mentioned. So, what was done originally by your previous consultant was kind of at a ten thousand foot level, and so the town really wanted to drill down and look at this in a lot more detail. It's a, as Chris said, it's a big decision, um, cost issue for the town moving forward. So. 
Um, what they want to do is really look at number three, alternative number three, which includes a consolidation in plant one, and look at the um, South Burlington option, which is number four. So to start the process, what the town did is, is they went out to a competitive selection process. The state requires that, um, that the town go through that to use the, uh, the state funds. So they did that. Um, it's qualifications based. The town received from several consultants. As Chris said, we were selected. So the next step is once we were selected, um, we met with the town staff and we put a scope of services together. Um, once we get that together, what we do is we submit a draft engineering services agreement. So this is the work that's been going on here over the last six weeks or so. Um, the state reviews the agreement. Um, I won't go through it. It's about an 80-page kind of standard document. <laughs> um, a lot of boilerplate stuff. Uh, they do review the fees to make sure they're appropriate. They also look at the scope of services to make sure they're, again, appropriate for the work that's involved. Um, so really the next two pieces of that, we have gotten approval from the state on the engineering services agreement. Uh, and one of the things that the town has the ability to do, which you've, you've done in the past, is they have a clean water SRF planning loan. So that's one of the things for consideration of tonight. And because the town went through this qualifications-based selection process, you qualify for 50% loan subsidy on the engineering for up to 100,000. So it was worthwhile to do that and make sense. So, um, so for tonight, um, one of the things for consideration with the town is finishing up preparing is a state clean water SRF planning loan application. Uh, that's a request for $82,900. And again, you qualify for the 50% loan subsidy and the other piece of that is just um, again for the board's consideration to authorize the authorized representative which is which is Lee to um, execute and approve the engineering services agreement you know the town is up against a deadline you know South Burlington is looking for like a yes or no commitment here pretty quickly so we're all anxious to kind of get this moving forward and you know, work it on the numbers and get some information so you guys have some um, better updated information to make some decisions as we move forward over the next few months. So. What is that, the Clean Water Stormwater Remediation Fund? No, it's the Clean Water SRF. It's the uh, planning loan fund. What does SRF stand for? Uh, it's the Revol Revolving Loan Fund. The state okay, yes. state revolving yep. 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 fund. So the request to us is for an $89,000 to enter into a... Yeah, the loan. loan. Yeah, that's right. And at some point, that's going to have to be signed so that the eighty-two thousand nine hundred, which half, half is a, yes, yeah, so the yeah, process okay. is a loan, but you qualify for fifty percent subsidy. Yep. Can I ask a provocative question? I, we've been listening. We've Chris has presented yeah, sure. uh, uh, this to us, uh, not this particular yeah, thing, yeah. but the issue of what we do to retrofit the current wastewater treatment plants yep. um, and we've seen a number of estimates of costs and all of yep. that but it didn't occur to me until speaking with uh, a colleague that we were presupposing that there are only three options right um, and my question is do, is it imperative that we do something are we going to be out of compliance if we don't take action it, are are the Wastewater treatment plants going to come to a screeching halt on January 1, 2025, or you know, you know, I never asked that question when you first came to us about a year ago, Chris, and I apologize. Yep. So typically, what happens is what the state really looks at is they look at the flow coming into your facility, and once you start reaching 80 percent of your design flow, then they require you to start going into engineering on how you're going to because it takes a period of time to go through the whole process and construction and stuff. So at 80% is when they want you to take a look at things. Um, right now, for plant two, I think we're, I wrote it down, but we're at around 58 to 60% of our hydraulic capacity. So our flows, we still have plenty of flow, but I think we're around 114% of our loadings going in. So we're over Unfortunately, we have a, a process that's able to handle it. So it's just a matter of time as long as we start getting, if we start getting more breweries and start, you know, people stuff that sure. have high strength ways coming to us um, is going to impact us even more. So um, we're so hoping. So you really feel like you have to go through this, you don't have a choice. Right, 
Right. It's not like we could buy another machine and install it and take care of that. Well, we're, you know, we could look at replacing all of our equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, but we also have some structural issues in the buildings and stuff like that. It'd be a substantial upgrade to keep the status quo with what we have with the two facilities. And but we didn't get a uh, estimate from you about what those costs would be. We did. We oh, okay. Was, that was the first that one. Would that would be was the most expensive. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, the charge. But I think yeah. Mary makes a good point, which I'd like to follow up with. And that is, uh, are you going to, will you have a section devoted to financing yes. alternatives? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because we have uh, in the community some special resources who are uh, not only adept, but very experienced with that, one of whom is sitting back there, uh, who I'm sure would be very welcome, as Chris knows and Peter knows, uh, to, to, you know, to take part in that or, or, or you know, give you a hand uh, looking at it. But I think the financing uh, aspects, and then maybe a short list of what the of what the inaction would cost, and what uh, technological replacement. Maybe just a little, uh, you know, half page on here are the other understandable ideas, and here are the potential. And you choose a metric as to what uh, as to what uh, uh, takes them out of consideration. Yeah. yeah. So just to. Respond to Mary's question. There's a part with the capacity. The second part of this is again the age and all the equipment. A lot of the systems in there are really designed for a 20 year life. And the problem is you get two plants that are what we call not very large, it's not very scalable. Yeah. So once that stuff starts to turn 20 years old, the state really wants you to start looking and see what's your plan moving forward because as that stuff continues to age, you got reliability issues, you're putting money into 25, 30 year old pieces of equipment. and they want to make sure that the town moving forward has a plan in place to continue to operate reliably and, and stay in compliance with your permit. Um, and where you're at doesn't mean you're going to have an issue two years from now, three or four years, but at some point, you know, um, I get it. Yeah. And, and as Chris said, you got two facilities, you know, it's labor and everything, and they're, they're small and it's just not economically. Well, I understand that right the yet, anomaly so, of yeah. the two facilities, but yeah. you know, so. the plant that I visited. I mean, it sounds odd, but yeah. it looked great. Yeah. Um, it looks like, you know, it's running like a top, sure. you know, and so you yeah. say to yourself, well, 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 well why does yeah. that all need to be replaced? Yeah. In, so. the, in the process you're talking about, this is anything that's going to happen or needs to happen over the next couple of years, but it may be a five, six, eight, ten year process. No. And, you know, right now they're 20 years old, but by the time you get a hold through this, It'll they're 27. And yeah. We see a huge, you know, I've done this for 25 some odd years and I'm, Believe it or not, I'm on my second round on some of these plans. <laughs> yeah. And there's a big difference between 20 years and 25, and then you get to 30, that there's a huge deterioration very quickly in a lot of the stuff between 25 and 30 years. And once you hit 30 years, you're kind of at that point but, you know, point of no return. So, you know, the timing is good. And, and then you don't have any time, right? That's and exactly, like, that's right, yeah. Well, that's got to be satisfying, though, that you can measure your career by <laughs> generations of, of plant construction. That's right, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what was a concern the last time, and it was, it was just a question of being unsure on, all, on everybody's part, and that is what, what potentially could be involved in, in running a pipe in terms of environmental impacts, yep. delays, the cost of time. Yep. And uh, we, we sort of put that, uh, everyone agreed that that could be a potentially very large and uh, deal-killing figure. Sure. And yep. so I think we'd look forward. But this is critical work, Chris, no question about it. I mean, what, we, what exactly, yeah. though, is included in the preliminary engineering review? Uh, it's so we start right, we're going through the two existing treatment facilities, all the operating data, um, the budgets. Uh, we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of different options as far as piping routes. So okay. we're going to be looking at Route 7. We've we got a couple of options in mind. Um, we're going to be looking at that for the consolidation alternative. We're also going to be looking at for the South Burlington alternative. Um, when we're looking at alternative number three which is plant number one we need to get into a lot of detail there because we really need to nail the cost in better and not just the construction capital cost but also the operating cost so we need to do a pretty detailed layout of that plant to see how that's that could look or would look if we're bringing all the flow over there to modernize that mm -hmm. um, what we can use what we can't use so 
As Chris said initially, it was a very, very rough kind of 10,000 foot level, and we need to get into that level of detail because this is going to be a major decision. And um, there's a lot of components to the cost. It's not just the capital construction costs. You know, we're looking at the <laughs> O&M costs. When we're looking at the South Burlington stuff, they need to upgrade their facility because of the age-related issues. Then there's the cost of the expansion component that the town of Shelbourne have to pay into. Yeah, then there's the operating costs. Yeah, yeah, then there's the operating costs yeah. to treat the flow. Then there's the O&M cost for Shelbourne to operate all that infrastructure. Yeah. So there's a lot of parts and pieces to okay. it. So, so what's yep. the timing for your deliverable? Well, to we're gonna have to we're gonna have to take this a little bit strategically. Honestly, there's not enough time to get to June or July to go through all these both these options and the level of detail. This is really takes a little bit more time. Um, so we're gonna kind of focus our efforts here a little bit to make sure we get what we need. Um, concurrently, the town's going to have to start the discussions with South Burlington to right. see what that's going to yeah. cost. And, but um, that deliverable will help inform those that's discussions, correct. Yeah, correct? That's right. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. at this point, that accommodates South Burlington's schedule, Chris, right? Correct. But so, it's tight. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's very yeah. tight. Yeah. Okay. Tight as it is. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There are some Let's get going. critical questions that we will be addressing with South yeah. Burlington sooner than later that depending on what they want to charge us could potentially sure. just take it right off yeah, the right. table. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And okay. won't require, yeah. It may not require the engineering analysis there, which can then focus elsewhere. So you need a motion on this loan? Yes? Correct. So then I would move to approve the loan for the CWSRF program uh, app, loan application in the amount of 82900 with the understanding that there would be a 50% subsidy so that the town would only need to borrow $41,450. Up to, yeah. As Up presented to. in Chris's memo number two. Yep. Thank yep. you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Jamie. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Okay. Thank you. Lee, do they need to supplement the motion to give you authorization to sign the engineering services agreement? You do? Okay, you got Probably good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably be okay. good to include this that. This is the authorized representative, yeah. That'd be yes. good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll amend yeah. my motion to yep. include Lee Crone, town manager, as the authorized representative Thank you. to sign all papers okay. necessary for that application. We did hear that, okay. and there's a second to Mary's amendment. Second. From Jamie, and another uh, vote goes approving. Please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Thank you. That's great. a very, great. very Thank useful. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming and thank you. All right, this is the second one, which is actually the first one, uh, the info and infiltration analysis. So as you were aware, part of what we're doing with Wayne, uh, this plays into a large part of it also, is trying to reduce the amount of flow yeah. that we're going to have to send to Plant 1 or to South Burlington, depending on our, our choices. So we, same thing, went through a solicitation process, and we have chosen Wright-Pierce Engineering out of New Hampshire. Um, they have a whole horizontal infrastructure group uh, as part of their engineering, so they can come in with flow meters, and they, they, this is what they do. So um, top-notch outfit. Um, they have submitted to me a draft agreement, um, and we're looking at getting that signed. Uh, what I was looking for tonight is just um, because we're having to use funds um, that were uh, that are of a high number um, that we would get approval from the select board. We plan on taking uh, funds out of the wastewater budget uh, in our capital improvement line item to pay for this. And Peter can speak more of that if you have any detailed questions, but. Um, He's assured me that we have the funds to be able to, to move ahead on this. I have a quote from them uh, for the agreement for $186,432. However, I expect there will probably be some uh, amendments to that and changes to that, some change orders. Uh, I am currently talking with them to delve into some of the hillside issues. Uh, actually looking at doing some knocking on door-to-door -door, um, inspections and stuff like that. Yeah. So we have yeah. 
uh, them working on the hillside area in conjunction with this. So, yeah. um, so I was I would like to see uh, approval of up to two hundred thousand dollars. If is this that's related to the line testing that's underway? No, on Shelburne Road is completely separate. It's completely separate. Okay. We recall that we last time we talked about this, we had a figure of upwards of fifty percent I and I. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which means the plant is getting one is getting an extra gallon, you know, uh, for every two. And uh, this this was very critical. And I think we left it at that point that when we we felt comfortable looking ahead, that we would we would be sure to make this kind of money available to do a decent job. And uh, I think this is really key. I mean, this will be a very thorough yeah. evaluation of these <laughs> system, system wide. System wide and okay. hillside all done at the same time, so you're comparing apples to apples. Right. Yeah, um, right. You haven't been able to get a handle on the infiltration issue, no. if I recall. Correct. Not yeah. system wide. Correct. And yeah. we've we've had a lot of piecemeal stuff done here and there, but we've never. Yeah. I mean, ideally, in order to to throw, you you know, to look at the low hanging fruits and get your best bang for the buck, we really want to try to do a whole system analysis, and then we know where we can go and get get the biggest benefit. Yeah. for the smaller amount of money, yeah. hopefully. So, um, unfortunately, we've been just doing things piecemeal in the past. Looking at our flows, because um, I knew some of these questions would come up regarding our flows to the facility and stuff for this, the item with Wayne, um, we, we've actually seen our flows at our facilities slightly decreasing mm -hmm. over time. I think that's because of some of the INI &I efforts that we've been implementing yeah. over the years. Yeah. So... Um, hopefully this identifies some of the real big ones and it will be beneficial. Another component to this um, is, which I need to still work out with them, is looking at doing some modeling of our sewer system. And we only just need to have that, a few of the, our choke points and some of the main trunk lines evaluated. So I wanna have them include metering in those certain locations. So that way, when we get development, like the issues that we're dealing with right now um, in the Route 7 corridor for the flow metering, um, we, we have that data and we can just punch that into a model when new developments come in and we're not, we're kind of staying ahead of it and when we see an oh, issue coming up. True. and yeah. So it'd be more proactive and stuff. So there's a lot of components to this INI &I analysis that we're doing, so... But this wouldn't, uh, this wouldn't tell us what to do in particular places. It would just identify where the issues are. This will tell us what to do. It will. It will tell us what the best practices to use, whether oh, it's, okay. we need to slip line, uh, a section of line, or whether we need to look at uh, sump pumps, or okay. whether we have manhole issues. And oh, okay. It, will, it comes out with a, they, they'll, they'll, one of the deliverables will be a complete plan on Great. what we need to address. And Hillside is there, as Jamie knows, because of, of the history as well as a, a specific environmental uh, situation uh, that has led to some considerable I and I, right? Correct. So we just need a motion, right? Move to authorize the inflow and infiltration analysis. Excuse Sorry, me, just one minute. Hi. Hello. I'm um, Luce Hillman. I'm just wondering, have we done any camera work of any of our lines to date, of yes. our sewer lines? Yes, we have. And what condition are they in? Roughly. Um, it varies all through town. Um, yeah, it varies all through town. Our, our oldest section of lines um, we actually just had replaced. Uh, we still have some old section of lines, but the majority of our sections of line we just had replaced as part of that uh, collection system upgrade that was done a couple of years ago. That, um, that should be a big benefit for us. And we still have some lines here in the Route, route 7 corridor that are still uh, 1950s era. Yeah. I mean, we just looked at lines in your neighborhood. Yeah, uh, that's well. what I heard. <laughs> the so we've got that height. inventory pretty much done of the manholes and the lines. Is that a majority of it's done, yes. Yeah, okay. we, we've probably, I'm going to say, we're probably, we've cameraed probably 75 to 80 percent of Plant 1's infrastructure and we're probably somewhere in the 50 percent range at, at the wastewater treatment facility number two in the southern area okay so this is mostly the door-to-door -door survey that's what we're spending and then um, the flow metering it's mostly the flow metering and then, then there'll be a small section of that will be the door-to-door -door for the hillside area okay 
And the flow metering will be based on assuming each flow from each house and comparing that to what's coming in at each service lateral, or are you going to do it? How, how are you going to do that? No, they put flow meters right in the main lines and measure based off from what they would typically look at, what should be coming from a normal household, and they'll calculate out what that should be. And even though we allocate 210 gallons a day, the average Less flow may be like 150. They're looking for anomalies in the... And they yeah. know that, so they, they'll calculate that in. And there's also infiltration. It gets calculated in per inch diameter of pipe per mile and stuff like that. So it's a whole engineering analysis and program that calculates everything out. Mm -hmm. And they can tell due to the rain gate, you know, to the because they'll have a rain gauge in there. They'll have groundwater monitoring going on along with the flow monitoring. So they're monitoring groundwater levels, they're monitoring rainwater levels, and the flow going through the pipe. And they can see how things react during certain events and everything to determine what are the sources that are coming into your lines and stuff. So it's pretty, it's pretty technical. Do we have a lot of combined sewer in town? We don't have any. That we know of. Well, yeah, that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, 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 yeah. That would be nice if we found one, to be honest with you, because that would be quick and easy. That would be yeah. an ex explanation. <laughs> yeah. All set? Thank you. Any other Thank you. Jamie can no? continue with okay. his motion. Move to authorize the inflow and infiltration analysis <laughs> and sanitary sewer evaluation with Wright Pierce Engineering as presented in an amount up to $200,000. So moved. Second. Seconded by Mary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those aye. opposed, nay. The ayes have it. So the third item we have is our phosphorus control plan. Uh, that's dictated by our, our MS4 permit, and we have to have a final plan submitted to the state by April 1st of 2021. And this April, we have to give a status report of where we are. Um, so this is us starting to get the phosphorus plan. I, I'm envisioning it being two phases. So um, at this phase, we've hired uh, Fitzgerald Environmental Associates. Associates. Um, the anticipation was that most of this is going to be paid through the wastewater budget, but we were able to um, apply for some grant money and we're still waiting on whether or not we're going to receive that and that f that's through the UPWP grant through the Regional Planning Commission and we've applied for $30,000 there's a 20% 20, 20 match required which is $6,000 for us the contract price I've received so far for phase one is $12,800 so we would um, we can fund we can fund the grant where we can fund the project completely out of our budget if we need to but we're hoping to get the grant and if that's the case then we'll have a 20 percent um, 20 percent match so the requ request is because all grants and stuff typically have to go through you guys is just approval uh, to apply in or to accept that UPWP grant from the regional planning if we do get it so we just need to authorize the grant application, yeah. not the actual consulting services agreement, right? Correct, correct. Okay. To the UPWP, is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Mary moves. Second. Jamie seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Number four. Uh, number four is our Bostwick Road. Uh, basically, right where the Waldorf School is, um, heading up the hill back towards Route 7, stretched down through there, looking at putting in a stone line ditch. And then once it gets down in front of the school, it actually, the, 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 the water moves away from the road and has actually created quite a ravine going down to where oh. it hits McCabe's Brook. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two, two parts to this project. One is the stone line ditch on Bostwick Road, and the other is the gully project to stabilize that gully and everything. Uh, looks like we have two grants uh, that we've applied for to, to fund these. Uh, one of those, one of them is our grant and aid. 
and that's for phase one and for phase two is the better roads grant so we're looking at approval for both of those grants tonight uh, $13,000 for the grant and aid and the better roads grant for 24000 any discussion? No. Hearing none, is there a motion to that effect? Move to Jamie? authorize grant applications for the CCRPC, Better Back Roads, and Grant and Aid uh, grants for the Bostrick Road Ditch and Gully Stormwater projects as presented. Jamie moved. Is there a second? second? Mary seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We're making some assumptions, Lee, that these are what you would recommend. Yes. Didn't mean to let you all it's entirely. <laughs> and, la and last but not least, we have our constructed uh, wetland, the gravel wetland that's being built on the South Burlington Shelburne line uh, off from the Pine Haven Shore Road. It's actually just to the north of the Blue Lynx property. It's right where the Velco, Velco has their uh, right of way down through there. Um, currently, this was approved by the select board back in April 12th of 2016 for $216,000. Since then, the project has, uh, the cost estimates have gotten significantly higher. Yeah. So currently what we have is a project that we're assuming is going to come in probably around the $700,000 range. Um, no idea if it, where it's going to be because we went out to bid twice already on this. The first time it went out to bid, um, the numbers were all way high, more than we had for funding. We went back to try to get more funding, went back out to bid a second time, and we ended up not having the, not having f favorable conditions for bidding, basically, is what it was. We were in the middle of the summer, and everybody was busy, yeah, and the, the numbers were crazy. So now we said, hey, this doesn't make sense. Let's go back. Let's wait. Put it out to bid in the fall, winter time, and for the next following year. So we're in the bidding phase right now. In fact, the bid opening is, is this Friday. And we have funding for up to $706,000 through the clean water, um, clean water grants. Uh, that requires a 50% match. We've met that match. We have $666,000 of match available through what the state has already vetted is through our Velco license that we're getting and the value of the land with that Velco license along with the, ease cost, the, the expense of the easements so that's our match. Um, so we have $666,000 available for a match. Um, hopefully we don't have to use all that, but um, we're, now we're just waiting to see where we're, we're gonna come, come in for bids. Would the match be 350,000? Is that how much we'd have to come up with? To, we have to pay 50% of the grant? I'm not sure I'm following. No, if the project comes in at, if the, if the construction, cost bids come in at six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars we have the funds through the clean water grant grant to pay that six hundred thousand dollars okay so so what's the what's the fifty percent the mat the fifty percent match would be well kind of an in kind match in yeah sense. it's kind of an in kind match but so oh, is the, is the idea that, that the revenues from the Velco license and easement are offsetting what would be a municipal match? That's correct. Okay. So yeah. do we have to authorize using those? Well, that's what my question would be. I say it's, it's probably to err on the side of authorizing this up to the $700,000, and which is the CIP stuff, the $706,000. Um, like I said, you guys authorized it before, but it was a, a lower dollar amount. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention yeah. that things had well, changed. I Can I ask why? Yeah. Why did it? Why did the costs? And are we looking at a possibility of that con kind of trend continuing? Or? Well, for one, I guess there was some discrepancy on what the our engineers' numbers came in at 
versus we we ha also had at the time a, a V Trans grant, and that changed the whole ball game on everything. Every, everything had to meet V Trans standards at that yeah. point, which is kind of crazy. We're not even in V Trans right away, and it's just because we're taking their money. And that drove the costs up significantly higher. So what we've actually done is we're pulling away from the VTrans grant and, and a lot of the requirements that VTrans requires and putting it back out, back out to bid without those requirements to see where these numbers come in. And we're thinking they're going to come in significantly lower. Oh, I see. Okay. And it, is this all stemming from a MRGP requirement? Is that it's, why we're doing this? It, it, no, it, it was stemming from the state f wanting to do something that predates me as far as issues and stuff in that area and wanting to remediate some of the stormwater issues. The benefit out of this that we're going to get is almost 25 pounds of phosphorus removal. Um, right now, I think we're estimating it's just we're required to remove something like 200 pounds of phosphorus um, as part of our... M our MS4 permit, and and this is going to be a this just this one project will be a 25 percent wow. or a 10 percent um, yeah of our removal. So it's it's a fairly significant project and worthwhile project. So I don't know enough about the Belco arrangement. I assume that everything's been vetted on that front and that we can apply yes those funds towards. We have the license agreement. We have the license agreement with Velco and all okay. that type of stuff. Yeah. It's a twenty-year license. Um, we have. And are, are they paying for any of this or no? That's their they're not, contribution. They're, they're not paying for any of this. Okay. Right now, we've been able to get one hundred percent grant funding. So Velco's not paying for it. In fact, we're actually having to pay for a small component. For Velco wants some under drain work done around one of their poles. Um, that's going to and this would be 2020 work? Yes. Okay. Yep. December 1st deadline for construction completion. Okay. So what do we need here, gang? Motion. Motion-wise. Motion Probably be helpful, as Chris noted, to yeah. get a fresh approval to pursue the project as presented. Uh, subject to the bid. Right. Subject to the bids. Why don't we subject this to the bids coming and pick it up on the 25th so we have a, a hard number? Is that a that problem would, waiting? That, no, that would not be a problem at all. All right, why don't we do that? That might be a good idea. Then yeah. we have real numbers in hand. Perfect. Good idea. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Chris. Thank you very much. It's clear you're busy. Good stuff. Expensive stuff. <laughs> it is. Thank you. And thank you both for being so patient. We appreciate that. <laughs> The next item is to review and approve uh, the town manager goals objectives for 2020. Uh, I had just one comment, Lee, and that was uh, in the in the printout. There's some extra material at the very end having to do with. Uh, uh, I think it was a a goal we abandoned having to do with fire rescue. Where is that? So you may want to strike that. At the very end, after three six, I see. Yeah. So no, the, I wondered the about theme that. statement after yeah. number six. Yeah, right. Yeah. I did wonder about that. I yeah. wondered about that too. Yeah. Yeah. We just dropped that out, and then uh, I, I'm going to encourage us tonight to not only to, to hear everybody's uh, reactions, but if possibly approve while Colleen is here. Uh, <laughs> She, I know, would want to be part of setting a, a new year and uh, has uh, devoted uh, six, almost six years worth of, to this subject. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so in, in Colleen's honor, if it's at all possible that we could approve this tonight, that would be nice. <laughs> okay. Press, pressure's on. I was like, all right. What's the best I way to go to through this <laughs> expeditiously? I, I so I wonder if we. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say I move to approve. Is there a second? I, uh, <laughs> We've been through it. Right. Or, <laughs> the organization to me was a little. I just there were a couple things that caught me as a little odd. Like for example, <laughs> in six, the theme is purchase and investment in pre-construction of Rice property site. Oh, and that's then the, the one goal that just itself. dropped. That's okay. the one yeah. that we're. 
All right. That's so gone. while we're reviewing for the for the for the benefit of the audience, there are four goals here. Uh, I'll read them off just in in title, so you have some idea what we're discussing. The first is stormwater municipal utility, which you've heard something about already tonight, and it generally involves if it's approved. We have some. We have uh, uh, objectives for for the town manager in terms of its implementation. Right, execution. And critical. in the case of economic development, some of you are very familiar with discussions we've had over time. Uh, there are a set of goals re relating to developing the program, essentially making some decisions on uh, how the monies that are in budget, if they're approved, to be spent, and so on. The third is organizational and other special initiatives. This is a composite. Of planning, of, re, of staff uh, planning, succession planning, updating the OIP, implementing auditor recommendations. And there was a series of administrative uh, steps that we think should be taken under certain timelines and are, are charging the town manager with objectives uh, for the same. So that's what we're, we're talking, that's the body of the goals and objectives. Above and beyond what he does. In addition to all of Yes, that. this is yes. all in addition Correct. to his regular day, so. Yes. Right. <laughs> when you have time. Yeah, that's right. When you have time, that's a good way to put it, Mac. And when you have time, when you think about it, yeah. So. But I, I think it should be obvious, but it's fair to say they're joint goals, right? We sort of yes. are reflecting the board's They're ours, too. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to thank the chair. You took the pen on this and you put a lot of time into developing this so thank you for doing that on the board's behalf it's it's a lot of work behind the scenes pulling this all together so I feel good about these goals I think it's manageable I sort of like the um, the framework of it the contents there timing some of this the, the dates I feel like there might be a little play in there when you start to stack it up the chronology you might get yeah yeah so I'm, right. I'm not going to get hung up on the the hard and fast dates, but maybe we tweak a few of those as we get into exactly the year on. after town meeting. But um, beyond I'll, that, I'll keep in active touch exactly. with the board yeah, as we can update, check, and adjust those yeah. Yeah. as needed. But and Lee, you feel these are sorry. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, good. Shoot. Um, you feel these are manageable. In other words, I feel they are, but I'm not you. Yeah. I think it's more manageable than our. Um, Overly, well, perhaps overly optimistic set that we had less. for the first year. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we all share the importance of these yep. goals. Yep. And the but ideas I, are I will ambitious. also keep yeah. in active touch if something yeah. starts to drift or yeah, fall behind. Yeah, and who knows what will come up, right? Exactly. As you know, we other issues tend to arise over the course yeah. of, of course. the year. Right. But I appreciate that we all acknowledge that and yeah. can be flexible over the course. And I think it's yeah. fair to say that our goals last year were pretty extensive. And then on top of it, we had the library, yeah. right? Which Fire I think, rescue, we had a yeah. few yeah, it was came along. Right. <laughs> a few other items. Just a, a lot few. of balls That weren't on there. As yeah. I said, so. But thank you for asking. Yeah. I'm prepared to approve these myself. And so... If it's yeah, not they're, they're ambitious, but it's a living document. I think there I mean, are, there's nothing in stone here. And if we see, obviously, <laughs> if some issue intrudes, it's going to take, an, you know, uh, extraordinary yeah. amounts of town manager time and energy and ours, then obviously that has to displace and right. or prolong, uh, you know, some of these. So uh, but I think Jamie makes a good point that it's our goals and objectives, and uh, we're measured, too. Yep. By, this, by, by their accomplishments, so. So I would move to approve these. Second. Mary moves and Colleen seconds, approving the town manager goals objectives as presented with that one strike uh, at the very end. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you very much, and thank you, Lee. You thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Less than five minutes. And the next item is a an agreement with Velco regarding Harbor Road. Wait, town you facilities. You provided us the background. The, fee, the use User fee. fee. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the use policy. Jeez, I got it almost to the end. Almost. <laughs> We're getting there. Close. Oh, well, if you want, you guys want to deal with that on March 10th. I'm okay with it. Sure. <laughs> Town facilities use user fee policy. Lee has updated and made a recommendation to us, which he's presented. 
Is there any discussion? So this was, remind me, this was just exempting. So this would essentially renew the prior exemption for meeting space here for nonprofit, nonprofit. groups yeah. or homeowners associations. Neighborhood associations, and right. So it's restoring an exemption we used to have and harmonizing with how the library's handling it. And they're making a change or two to harmonize with ours. Mm -hmm. The goal to which their we, policy. Okay. is to have one set right. of policies for both. Which makes a okay. lot of sense, yeah. The track shall meet at some point? Yes. Okay. Um, and then there's, is there a second? No, we're going to hold on okay. the form-based zone piece until okay. we deal with the form-based zone. Good idea, right? yeah. So if you're good with that, good with that, a motion to approve and we'll update the fee use policy accordingly. Is there such a motion? Move to approve the town facilities use and fee policy as presented. Jamie Second. Moore. Colleen seconded. Colleen seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Uh, just as a quick editorial comment, we had uh, a different policy than did the library regarding use, in their case, use of the community room, for which they were not charging. And as you may know from prior discussion, we had, a, we had installed a charge for using these spaces. So this is gonna, this is gonna bring them right into sync. Okay. Now, the next item is the wastewater allocation for the Fiddlehead no, Brewery. This is Belco. This is Belco. <laughs> you want to go. Oh, Belco. Now I appreciate your enthusiasm, <laughs> though. <laughs> do. Wants to, <laughs> wants to check the returns in New Hampshire. Hop, skip, and jump. It is going to be jump. finished with Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're working on 10 o'clock. So. Yeah. Okay, the next slide. How long can we keep her here? <laughs> 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 Only so long. Yeah. Can we filibuster? Would that be okay, <laughs> doctor? <laughs> Would that be okay if we just kept running yeah. here until <laughs> me? Okay. <laughs> no, and the next item, in fact, is to review and approve the agreement with Belco regarding Harbor Road. So this is the same exact form as we've seen before. It's an, as you know, we have the Velco substation on Harbor Road. If they need to bring in a very heavy transformer, you can't do that in pieces, and they're agreeing to restore any damage to the road that they might cause. The only change here is they're proposing a three-year agreement, which I think benefits the town as much as anything, and we don't have to churn through this each year. It was reviewed by council Agreed. last year. It's a simple agreement. If you're good with it, a motion to accept and authorize me to sign would suffice. Thanks. So moved. Colleen moves. Second. Second. Mike seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And the next is the wastewater allocation for Fiddlehead. Yes. This is a request for a wastewater allocation for up to 1,323 gallons per day. This is for their tasting room, which they already have up and running. If you've visited there, they've got all the picnic tables inside. Chris has approved it, no problems. There's a minute difference in calculations, but if we go for the up to 1323, turns out to be 1305, we're, we're all covered. It's not a material difference. Move to authorize the wastewater allocation for Fiddlehead Brewery tasting room up to 13. 123 gallons per day. Second. Moved by Jamie, seconded by Colleen. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The next item is this is a certificate of legal status, I guess best yes. called. It's a most curious document entitled Certificate No Appeal or Suit Pending. This relates to lodging of the grand list. It's been signed by Ted Nelson, our assessor. It says, we hereby certify on this date there are not any appeals pending from action of the listers nor suits pending to recover taxes paid under protest relating to the grand list of Shelburne, Vermont. If you're good with this, this one does require all the board's signatures. But we don't need to, there's no motion. We just need to sign it. Yeah, I guess, guess you so. could motion yeah. to certify to this effect and by signing to yeah. our knowledge that is correct right and accurate yes ted's already signed it and 
essentially. Some, some night when we have some time, it'd be, be interesting to know what, yeah, well, what generated this. It's a statutory requirement. I've yeah. actually never seen it before, but Ted did attach the statutes that require this. It's most peculiar. I think it's one of those things like when you certify so you don't to, owe child support or something. You know, right. Just something certifies. Well, why so don't we have an enabling motion that just, just that establishes the fact that uh, we're approving and by and will uh, authorize by signature. So moved. So moved by Colleen. Second. Seconded by Mary. Those approving, yes. please signify Colleen. by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, aye. nay. The ayes have it. Move to adjourn. Moved by Colleen. That was quick. Second. Seconded by Jamie. And goodbye, Colleen. We will see you at town meeting. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.